Um, all right, everybody, we are live tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming out. I thought I would invite Kenny out tonight and we'd kind of discuss our recent purchases. We both have picked up the Thompson Center Compass, chambered in 308. And I need to mute my other computer in the other room because I can hear myself. <laughs> Good evening, guys and fellas. Thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about this great deal and uh, kind of some plans we got going on with it. So uh, as you know, uh, Josh is doing some low development as well as I. Um, hopefully we can probably get Ocean on here. He's he's also got the same rifle. Um, and we'll, we'll pretty much discuss basically what we plan on doing with it. I will send Ocean an invite here. So I did go out and shoot mine a few times today. Okay. I tried some Hornady 168 ELDs. Now these rounds I had loaded up for that other rifle of mine, and I just wanted to kind of give them a try, and they they didn't do too well either. Mm. So I just had one charge to try. It wasn't like a low development or anything, but yeah, yeah. Um, on that last testing, I just put that video up that I, I went ahead and basically loaded up uh, forty-four five, kind of working in point one grain increments, and uh, that's what I plan on seeing what these do. Basically, uh, I kind of want to stick with the one sixty-eight just because it's it's the good weight balance with ballistic. This is coefficient ratio for long range. That's that's what I'm most interested to myself. That's yeah. Um, it seems like I think you know it might it might like the 150s a little more, but I, I don't know. You know that's one thing we need to try. So uh, last night I ordered some, I believe 155 Hornady match bullets. So I do want to go ahead and jump down to that 155 and just you know see if they'll perform. And then, yeah. you know, we are talking about chronograph, so I ordered the Magneto Speed, uh, the Sporter one. So I should probably have it tomorrow, so. Oh, man. I might have to have, trip too. I just, I had a little Christmas money, and I had a little YouTube money, and I was like, I'm going to go ahead and get it and be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got to just jump on it, too. It just, it's annoying with these chronographs that you got to go out there, you know, for me, I got to unwind the cable, set up the sticks, you know line it up correctly and then when you need it to work it just doesn't work <laughs> yeah I think last night i went out and in the evening when the sun's real low in the sky i have a lot of trouble with it so i set up a second tripod and i had like two coats hung from it a cardboard box i had it completely shaded and i, I shot 12 rounds and like i told you i got four readings and that was it and i was i was about ready to put a bullet right down the middle of it i just <laughs> it was so frustrating yeah enjoying the club um, basically, I mean, what, what uh, there's probably some people out there, some folks are wondering why we need a, why we need a chronograph. Would you want to kind of hint on that? Or? Well, there's a couple different ways before, when I first started all this reloading, I didn't have a chronograph. I just kind of estimating velocities on shooting long range, figuring out what my dial was and kind of doing it the old fashioned way. And that got me within maybe 50 feet per second. But to determine if you got a good load, you really need to know how tight of a, a string you got as far as uh, extreme spread, standard deviations. There's also the uh, Saturday load development, which that was my plans last night to do some of that with some uh, 147 ELDs in my 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, I'm loading up some Starline brass. The uh, case capacity is quite a bit different than Hornady brass. So, and what's crazy is I don't have my sheet with me, but I loaded up in two tenths increments and I think I had six rounds. So we're talking about, I don't know, a two grain difference, shot a one inch group with that whole wide, wide variety. I just didn't get any, any results I could use. But I see uncle Jim says pro chrono. Now the first one I borrowed uh, about a year and a half ago, hundred percent, never had any errors, anything with it. The one I have now, I've just had fits with it. It just, I don't know. I just, I hate it right now. If I have an overcast sky, sun's not out, it, it's good. I can tell the velocities are good. The standard deviation's good. The last two or three times I've been out, uh, standard deviations have been 40 to 50. And I, I know my loads are better than that. And that's just where I've lost all confidence in it. Yeah, that's what I'm finding out too online. Um, 
where, where I shoot and the direction I shoot, the sun just hits it just correctly. And, you know, I, I tend to shoot in the afternoon now, as of right now, because of my work schedule. Um, and I'm finding my center deviation and string spread numbers to be 50, 60. Um, and I'm just like, same thing with you. I, I just don't believe that. Yeah. Um, with the 6.5 Creedmoor, I, I don't know if it's possible, but I've got readings with my 140 grain ELD bullet uh, to be around 2,900 mm -hmm. with a 24 inch barrel. Um, I, I don't think that's, it's probably possible, but not with my barrel, not with my elevation. So I, I'm the same way. Um, for those folks uh, who don't know, you want your, your velocities, a shot for shot to be near the same. So when you dial up your elevation for long range, especially when you're reaching out a thousand yards, um, a difference of 10 FPS can put you six, seven inches off target. So that, that's the whole reason why you, when you do load development with the, uh, using a chronograph, um, everything nice and tight as far as your stream spread numbers, it's going to get you a better chance of hitting impacts. So I'm reading through some of the comments here and, uh, one person, uh, 22 snipers said, be careful with the point of impact. I am very aware of the point of impact changes, but that is something I'm willing to deal with to get ac ac accurate uh, information out of it. Um, I'm probably not going to shoot with it all the time, but a little bit of this, uh, <laughs> oh, Uncle Jim, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to the side chat up. Um, it's hard to stay on topic or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me let me grab my computer real quick. That way I can read everybody's comments. Yeah. So uh, to start out with, I when I got my rifle, I'll just kind of start from the beginning. I had some 150 grain, I believe Remington soft points, and that's what I took out initially. I think I had six rounds. I uh, zeroed the scope with it and shot, I don't know, two inch group with it. I started loading the uh, Spear 168. Yeah, I started loading the uh, Spear 168 bullets, and I went out, and I've got all my targets with me here tonight. I can kind of show them to you. And I had this little spacer, which you guys know, you know, comes with the rifle, and I had this thing wedged between the barrel and the stock, and I proceeded to shoot uh, three and a half groups with this wedged in the gun. The, uh, the groups that day were anywhere from 1.8 all the way up to 2.3. I'll kind of show these up here, you guys, but uh, these were the first shots. This is shots six through about 26 through the rifle, and uh, they just, nothing there. I didn't really believe it, so I, I, I made a video on that, but I did not post it. I ended up reloading uh, pretty much the same charges again, only I used Varget and CFE 223, and pretty much the same results. Varget was uh, 1.3 to 1.9. And then the CFE was 1.7 or two and a half. And then that one group had actually done pretty good. And that was the one I had to hang fire on. Mm. And I thought that might be a fluke or I don't know. It was worth shooting again. And the second time out, it was, it didn't do anything. So yeah. I loaded up some uh, Hornady 125 SSTs. And that is uh, the round I was loading in 300 blackout. Back when I was loading 300 blackout, I thought 30 cal bullet will give it a try. And they shot very well. I had two groups, uh, one 5.541 and the other 6.38. And uh, I was pretty impressed with those. So that tells me there's really nothing wrong with the rifle, the uh, setup. It's there. It's just finding something it, it likes. Yeah. So I had a few comments as well um, talking about the Saturday method. And I'm a big, firm believer of doing that Saturday method. I really think it works uh, great. Um, for me personally, I, I kind of wanted to put more bullets down the tube just to kind of get a, you know, polish it out, break, kind of break it in somewhat, but also get a feel behind the trigger because it's totally different from all the rifles I shot. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I do plan on doing a Saturday method uh, as well. Um, a lot of folks recommend this powder here for the 308, which is the IMR 4064. Now, I got quite a bit of this. I actually shoot this for 223. I cast that 223 and actually gives me pretty good performance. Uh, I haven't tried it in anything else though. I have a uh, New York City Reloaders uh, cast bullets and they're around 153 grain. So I don't know right now, maybe a good time to try to load up some of them and give them a try. But, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, if it's definitely a weight issue, these ought to be in the sweet spot, you know, to work. Yeah. And then I heard uh, Ocean, I don't know where it was, talk about how he had a bad shoulder. If I knew that, I would have recommended to go with the 6.5 Creed more for that rifle. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've been messing around kind of off camera uh, with the NOE spiral point, um, spiral, spiral point um, flat base bullet. Yeah, and then with a pistol powder, this is a 150 grain. I'm using HP 38, around 10 grains. It, it seems to be a really fun plinking round at MOA. So I think that's something that uh, I'll put a video pretty soon about that too. Um, and you know, I, I developed that mostly for my son. Um, though I can see he has pretty good control of the rifle, uh, I just want him to get more trigger control. Things he forgets, like as far as the level. Um, canting of the rifle. Yeah, um, like the, the basic standard. fundamentals anyway. Yeah, basic fundamentals. So I could develop a sub 500 yard um, load, pet load, that he'll be able to go out there and just have some fun with me. Um, like I said, it is his rifle mostly, but I'm having so fun. Is that, does that break really tame in the recoil on that rifle? Yeah, yeah. You were right about that break. I, I didn't think uh, it would tame it down that much, but it honestly feels like a... Uh, how to say, uh, kind of like a uh, like a two two three, like a heavy grain two two three. Um, now it's kind of weird how, how yeah. I can kind of relate that to my AR because it's exactly what it feels like. Um, one thing I do like about the Varget powder is that it's a just a nice fast jolt mm -hmm. with a push on a, you know most traditional stick powders. So uh, he's able to actually manage that jolt because it's got a nice squishy uh, a squishy pad to it. Yeah. I shot mine, I believe, six times without the break, and I mean, it, it's a 308. It's got a little kick to it, but I noticed every time I'd shoot, the uh, the muzzle would jump over to the left on me a lot, and, I, and that was shooting 100 yards, and it, it was jumping four or five inches every shot, and I was like, this ain't going to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, talking about the rifle, I mean, the rifle has a lot of great features of it. You know, the three-lug design, 60-degree bolts, it's set up for precision. Um I don't. I haven't heard of anybody rebarreling the thing. I mean, what do you think of that? Uh, somebody told me there is a company, and I'll have to look back through my comments that does offer a a barrel swap for it. But okay. you know, two hundred fifty dollar rifle, so that's probably not in real high demand. People to rebarrel one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, I want to go back comment here. Um, let me find it. Uh, Bill Johnson said, should that spacer be used or is it just a piece of advertising? Uh, it is a piece of advertising. And if you watched uh, Johnny's Reloading Bench, he he mentioned this, that it actually slides down the barrel channel and he was going to store his rifle that way, kind of help keep the barrel centered up and, you know, keep things true. And that was my plan. It's just when it's underneath that barrel stuck in, I forgot about it. You know, I went to the range and I didn't even see it, you know, behind the rifle. And then I was, I was off to the side and I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That thing's still in there. <laughs> but, uh, it's on the bench now. It's going to stay there. I need to just throw it in the trash, I guess. But that's kind of my little reminder right now. Yeah. Well, it may come in handy. I mean, Boyce does make a stock for this rifle. Uh, Johnny, Johnny has it. I'm actually thinking about doing it as well. Um, just because I want more of a vertical grip you know, for us pro and shooters, you know. When I uh, I had my stock off and I actually slid it in and then when I torqued my stock down, you know, I use that to help center up the rifle. I think that's a great tool for that as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Johnny was on here in the before we went on live and he said he was uh, starting in the middle of finishing up a 300 Win Mag Compass video. And uh, he said it's been pretty difficult. The throat's three miles long and the uh, stuff loaded at standard length is shooting awful. So... I think we can kind of relate to that. Most of my rounds have been at uh, the book length. I have shot a couple of Varget loads out the 2840, and then the uh, the Hornady bullets today were at 2840, which we both come up, me and Kenny both, with about a 2.90 uh, overall length to the lands. Our, our rifles are probably the same lot off the same line, probably the same day. So, Yeah, yeah you got it from Kentucky Gun Company as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, our rifles should be identical. Uh, I know a lot of the Ruger Americans, the, the two I've had, the other, that one I had borrowed, it was a, a lot different than mine because it was a year newer. The barrel, the outside finish of the barrel was different. 
Uh, I've actually shot some of my brass and his and the uh, the chamber when I go back to resize it the fire form you know check the uh, bullet comparator on it. it it was a different chamber a little bit different it's a different reamer anyway yeah yeah um, I did make a couple tools I mean just to see how close it is compared to the Hornady comparator uh, James Pollard is the one that actually mentioned this but basically getting your fire form case I'm not sure how well this is showing yeah, I can see it. Yeah, just putting a slit down the middle of it right there on a you know next size case. And it's it's pretty dang accurate. You know, you yeah. get the comparator, it's actually a pretty cool tool. Uh, I did try that method of um reaming it out and then putting like a screw down it. Yeah. I, yeah, that works too, but I found just closing the bolt nice and slow helps as well. Which I usually just take a piece of fired brass and I'll take just a pair of pliers and I'll just oval that neck ever so slightly just to give it tension. Then I, I just chamber it, you know, three or four times. And when I start getting consistent results, that's what I go by. And that's yeah. worked for me. Yeah. Uh, did you do a jump test in any of your loads yet or? Uh, not really yet. I haven't got that far to it. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, I, I've shot at least 40 rounds that, um, of this was it the 168 grand AMAX bullets? Yes. And then should be very similar to that Hornady ELD. I think they just replaced that bullet. Uh, yeah, what's funny is you know, I thought they discontinued the AMAX, but apparently on Midway you can still purchase it. Um, the, the ELD does give a slight advantage with ballistic coefficient. That's what I figured. Yeah, about 10 or 15 more. So the profile is a little, little different. So, I mean, that's just what I had locally here. Okay, yeah. I can get it. The guy has. 15 boxes so you know and i've had a lot of people you know offer you know hunting bullets soft points and and that's not really the bullet i'm interested in right now i, I want a, a bullet capable of a thousand yards you know that yeah. i want a high bc bullet a match bullet uh, <clears throat> that's about all i'm interested in. now i will i would be interested in some other things but initially that's what i want to get the rifle set up for yeah um it, we mentioned on slack as well talking about a kind of a cool bullet uh, that no one's really known about. Um, I actually recently came across it from some F-class shooters and they're very high ballistic coefficient bullets. Uh, they go in, they have it, they're listed here on Elco. It's alcobullets.com. Mm -hmm. They're a rebated bow tail design, uh, aluminum tip. And we're talking about a bullet that if you were to shoot it at 2,600 FPS on 168 grain, it would outperform on a ballistics uh, velocity um, reaching out there uh, it'll outperform with Rainer Wind Mag. I, uh, I wasn't familiar with those when he, when he was telling me about them and I checked out the site and and my concern is loading those like with my seating stem on my lead die because a lot of these ELD bullets I'm leaving a pretty good ring and I could just only imagine you know aluminum tip bullet going in there at a super sharp point. Yeah, yeah. And it was funny is I was really, really upset with the Hornady seating die because when I first got it, the seating stem um, was just making this bullet rock back and forth like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, uh, a concentricity gauge and uh, it was throwing the concentricity out to like 15,000. Yeah. So uh, I changed the seating stem out to well, I thought I, I thought I got the 168 grain ELD seating stem, but if you can see, I got this crazy 225. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it's really opened up, but what's funny is that it actually works with almost every bullet. It's nice and tight. So, so on those seating stems, I've heard that you can kind of turn down the back end and use those in a lead eye. Do you think you could do that? Just looking at it. You know what? Um, yeah, I could probably look into that. It looks very, very similar to the profile of the lead. I, I've heard of people doing that. I don't know if anybody out there in the uh, – I think, uh, Curtis, you might have done that or know a little bit about that. But I've been debating about buying one and seeing if I can make it work. Yeah, I've heard of people, too, using a, a, a like JB Weld, and then they get a bullet and they kind of slot the bullet out to kind of make a cutter. On our lathe, if you, if you do have a little lathe, then you could actually specifically form a seating stem, um, you know, with that bullet profile. So um, the uh, those Fort Scott solid copper rounds, I was having a time with those with my uh, lead die because that was a, it's kind of like those Alcolas. They was a very sharp pointed bullet, and uh, the first round it it dug into it. I loaded. I mean, it made a nasty burr, 
And I ended up taking this Dremel, my Dremel with this uh, kind of a, a, I don't even know how to describe the bit, but it was, uh, it's kind of like a, a milling bit or whatever. And I actually opened the, the uh, inside of that stem up a little bit and it wasn't bad. It, it was leaving a ring still, but it wasn't really digging in. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really, um, that's what I found too with, with this uh, original seating stem. It, it will basically, uh, it, it hits it. It kind of mushrooms it out a little bit. Like, uh, Curtis, we was talking about modifying a Hornady seating stem to work in a Lee die. Yeah. He was out there in uh, La La Land, I think. <laughs> I think he just jumped on. Oh, we got Gunfun ZS here. I just run through the chat. We have uh, Reloading Press, Gunfun ZS, Tim Robinson, PC Bullet Empire, uh, James Pollard is on. Um, I see you're in the chat as well, Uncle Jim. Uh, by the way, uh, he's got a great gift. I think he had the best Christmas this year. Uh, Lever Guns 5, 5110 is on. You guys got to check out that channel, man. This guy does awesome ballistics tests with that Lever Guns, and he's got some beautiful rifles, man. Uh, Treads in the house. And 22 Sniper, C. Ray, Vanessa Kitty. Jamie's on, Bill Johnson. Wow, we have a lot of folks. Yeah, I'm showing 41 viewers currently. Wow, yeah, yeah. So Curtis says, yes, I have, and I've turned my own custom stems as well. So that's good to know. I may I may pick up a couple of those seating stems and see if I can make them work because I've been I've been kind of fighting. There for a little bit, I was telling a West Desert Shooter, I was taking the tiny corners of a, a shop towel, and I was actually wedging them in there, and it worked good until it fell out. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's actually a pretty good idea. And if it falls out, your overall length's just a little bit longer and you know it, so it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, the folks that know me, I'm, I'm pretty much in, I don't know, call me cheap. I just, <laughs> just kind of want to see what I could do as an average person with budget tools. And like like you're saying, if you were just to manage to seat the bullet or put the bullet on top of your cartridge as straight as possible, that usually helps the run out along with spinning the case when you're uh, seating the bullet. Um, that's something I think Tin Man was starting to do now. This channel. Yeah, Reloading Press says we're not cheap or thrifty. But that's kind of the whole uh, basis of my channel. I like taking these budget rifles and, you know, use, you know, the Lee Press, the Lee Dyes, and, you know, make them work. And you done your little test on the uh, Lee Dyes on the uh, concentricity, I think, on the brass. And it was amazing. I mean, it was some, it was good, almost zero run out. And I'm thinking, you just done enough testing for me. I'm sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I kind of thought in, in the lines it would be all right just because modern day tooling is pretty concentric itself. Um, it, it may be questioned because I, I thought about getting the wooden gunworks uh, custom um, dies for the Creedmoor. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy with what I got set up. And one thing I did update was or upgrade as a die is the RCBS gold match. Well, it's. Yeah. Now, this is a uh, pretty cool die because you just drop the bullet right in there and it does the whole thing yeah. for you. That's kind of crazy because this uh, this 460 die has that little window in it too, you know. But yeah. that bullet is so long, it barely fits in the press. So. <laughs> now, um, Charlie, I believe, did a write-up or an article one time that you could actually just buy one of these dies specifically for a, cal a caliber and you could call RCBS and get the interchangeable bushings and stem and change the caliber without buying another die. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just these little uh, the little collar in the middle there, along with the stem. Because just as long as the case lines up with the bushing and, and your stem is yeah. all there is to it. So, yeah, some of those, I know that Redding uh, micro micrometer die, I mean, that's a pretty impressive looking die, but it's got a little price tag on it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, bullet seating seems to be uh, where I'm finding the run out. My errors on run out. Um, I, I do want to try the the new Lyman All All American press though, because a lot of folks are telling me it's a pretty good press too. And then Von Precision done that video kind of on the run out of his Lee press, and mine's mine's starting to get there. I don't think it was near as bad as his, but that's something I want to keep an eye on. And and you know, my, I think my groups, my my loads are still shooting good enough. I I, I don't need to scrap this press yet, but it's something I'm gonna watch. I know. Um, unfortunately, I've been using the Value Tour Press a lot, 
Um, when I first got it, I kind of was using it to swage bullets um, and do all kinds of weird things. I actually uh, started making my own 45 bullets for a friend of mine, swaging them down out of a 40 Smith and Wesson brass. And I think that's where this press took a big hit off of it. So uh, I think I'm due for another press pretty soon. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having another one out in the garage when I cast to size bullets with. Go ahead and mount it out there. I mean, it'd just be handier for me, which I did some nine millimeter casting today. I have starting to get kind of low. I've loaded a lot of nine millimeter in the last about week and a half. But uh, I, uh, yeah. I got red bullets and blue bullets. They're exactly the same, but I just, I just love those blue bullets. That's my color. So <laughs> I got to make some more. <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to ask the audience here. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of folks here that, that really don't do a lot of long range precision, but do have a 308. Um, is cast bullets, you know, more aimed at what you're, you really want to see as far as what you can do with your cast loads or is the precision shooting that we're doing um, kind of helping you out, figure out what kind of loads you want for your hunting? I think our, I think, you know, the reloaders network's about a 50, 50 split. You have your, uh, you have your cast shooters and you have your, your jacket to bullet shooters. So, I mean, I'm new to the cast. I, I still need to get back on my 223 rifle rounds. I, uh, I kind of abandoned it, but I need to get back on that. We're, we're ready to get some, we're in like a wind advisory and rain tomorrow. So I've actually shot every day since Saturday and then I'm going to have to probably sit out tomorrow. So tomorrow may be some uh, powder coating and I may sneak off to a couple gun shops or something, but yeah. PC yeah. wants to see it all. He says, <laughs> see, see it all. Um, yeah, uh, Nathan says the precision uh, fits more uh, with both of what you guys are doing right now. So he, he likes to see him, he likes seeing our precision loads. Um, Nathan, uh, you have a beautiful Bushmaster AR. That uh, that looks awesome, and I can't wait to see you shoot that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I, I, that's awesome. The 450 Bushmaster always kind of intrigued me, but I always thought, well, if I get a 450 Bushmaster, I'm going to need a 458 SOCOM. Yeah. So. Then you'll need this uh, this this four fifty eight diameter bullet here too. So <laughs> yeah, no, the, uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know how gorgeous that that rifle was. The bluing was just awesome. Oh, it's 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 like clear coated the whole thing. I mean, the barrel shiny, the wood. I mean, pictures do not do that gun justice. It is amazing. And neighbor stopped by, found another box of ammo for it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, that that's a cool neighbor in. This so, story behind it is pretty cool, man. Yeah. So what he wants me to do, he's got a, a brother-in-law out in Nebraska or something, and, and he bought this gun in the middle 70s. And uh, actually, this box here has got a couple of his loads in it, and it's dated 1977. <laughs> but I have six uh, factory rounds, and uh, he wants me to chronograph those and then at least get a uh, like an H4350 or a Winchester 760 load velocity equal which I told him I got the 2,500 the other day and he kind of shook his head and he goes, you got to go more. He goes, you need to get about 2,600. So my, <laughs> my shoulder is finally recovered. It's not tender or sore anymore. Uh, I shot yeah. that Saturday and I could still feel it yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I forgot who commented it, but yeah, it was good that you're standing that way. You didn't get the full uh, just or jolt of that rifle, man. But and I, I considered. I threw a bag in, and I, I still may shoot it off the bench. But the next time I shoot, it's just going to be a couple rounds. I'm not going to go out there and do eight more just for fun. But it's just going to be strictly chronograph and then load up a couple. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really cool rifle, man. But a hundred, the last load was 114 grains of H4350 in that load. <laughs> yeah. So. And, uh, uh, Gun fun, uh, going back to the question, I, I guess he says uh, he could do both, but he likes to see more cast for the money. Um, I also think there's a lot more room for improvement and innovation. Jacketed is mostly developed. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You can make some really cool rounds. Um, shoot, I don't know if I had that bullet on me, but just I have a little flat point 30-30 round that mm -hmm. I don't mess around with, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's showing its promise, too, and yeah, you can do a lot of things with that. I, I would like to see what that does with ballistics gel or just yeah, uh, yeah. And I need to get on that like uh, TATV Canada making his own ballistic gel. I mean, that's something any one of us can do. I think, and yeah. I, I would love to have some. You know, it's just so expensive to buy it and use it once or twice. 
Yeah, I, I made it before. I went through about, I think, 80 packets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was nuts, dude. And all I did was made a little 16 or 14-inch block. And it still cost me roughly around 30 bucks for wow. all that. But the weird part about it is that you can actually melt it down and reuse it, mm -hmm. but it's organic. So after a while, if it's in your refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah, they say it goes stale, I guess, after a while. It, it, it stinks, man. It, it smells like rotten eggs. Oh, yeah, the wife won't be too happy. <laughs> and and with the rifle rounds, you about need two blocks anymore because you're going to penetrate that first block. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, the water jug test is a pretty good indication of, of uh, expansion. and. Yeah. So... I've done that with uh, pistol carry rounds before. That was actually before I started YouTube, and I took all the hollow points I could get my hand on, had a ton of milk jugs, you know, expanded them out, measured them, and uh, I had bonded bullets, non-bonded bullets, and uh, the, the spear gold dot, and that's actually what I carry now. They done awesome. It was an amazing-looking bullet. Expansion was unreal. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, Jamie also thinks uh, the cast is where the challenge is. It is, brother. Um, yep. <laughs> as y'all know, um, I like pushing the limits of a lead bullet. And uh, I don't know, for me, I want to kind of merge the two together, long range and a cast lead bullet. Um, it's definitely possible. We got Walt, uh, Coach Brothers, yeah. firearm. he's doing it. Three, three Winchester, 500 yards. And uh, you know, Tim, to, what he's saying is, He's getting better performance with a traditional lube bullet. Um, I actually have some of his bullets here. And I kind of agree with it. You know, um, the powder coat has limitations. And you can only lay the powder coat as even as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, with these uh, cast lead bullets, when we're in a, a three-way cartridge or even a high-pressure cartridge, we're spinning these bullets at high RPM. And that unevenness will cause a little bit of deviation in the bullet. Yeah. So, um, well, it, it's out of balance. You know, it's just like a tire. Yeah, and I, I don't know how the how the lube um, counteracts that because you can see when he shoots it, you can see that it looks like the lube is stripping out or just smoking. So <laughs> I, I don't know. For some reason, traditionally lube bullets that are gas check, hard cast bullets seem to be a, a lot better accuracy for higher velocities. Um, Another reason why I went with a 308 is because I was actually getting good performance with a paper patch bullet on my 36. But unfortunately, uh, when I was moving, um, through the process of moving, I actually damaged the barrel, the crown of my barrel. Ooh. I dropped the rifle and for some reason hit a rock just right on the front of it and uh, put a nice little divot on there. So, um, Two options on that rifle, because I actually really like it. It has a really nice trigger. It's a, basically, it's a Mossberg 810. Um, back in the day, you could probably pick those up for about 110 bucks. Hmm. Uh, I thought about rebarreling the thing, but that would cost uh, roughly 400 bucks. So I went this route and bought another TC Compass. Um, yeah. Mostly, yeah, mostly for my son to get into long range with me. So and, what what poundage do you think your trigger's down to on your Compass? Um, with that little mod, it honestly feels like a work AR trigger. So it's just around four pounds. Yeah. Mine's probably pretty similar to that. Yeah. Uh, I've heard of someone making an aftermarket trigger for it. Do you know anything about that? Uh, there's a Embarco spring kit and, yeah. and actually the two springs in it, you change out and then you pretty much just adjust it the same. And I watched that video and, you know, they tear the trigger down and, you know, I'm understanding how it works. And I was thinking, I can do that myself, yeah. you know, you can change springs and I'm still using the factory spring, but the two nuts allow, you know, how far that spring moves. So I shimmed, I actually got rid of that one nut and replaced it with a washer and that allowed, but it was a fine line of being drop safe because I had it where I wanted it. I mean, it was like a two, two and a half pound trigger breaking clean. And then I would drop it, you know, six, eight inches off the ground. It would trip it. So I was like, that's no good. So I had to go a little bit more. And then I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say four pounds roughly. And uh, it, it's been drop safe and I feel comfortable with it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same as well. That's, that's one of the main things that I was like, okay, well, I could work the trigger down even further, but it's got to be drop safe because it is my son's rifle. Yeah. Now we do have quite a couple of folks here that, sit, that do agree that embargo or M carbo trigger spring kit is a good way to go. I would like to know if, if those guys, uh, have you guys tried drop safety or 
dropping it to see how i know there's uh there's two spring kits available one's you know a light precision and i almost wonder if it's not yeah and then the other's more drop safe but i mean that kit's 20 bucks but you're just getting a couple springs for 20 bucks exactly yeah it, it it might be just tuned correctly but just simple mechanics looking at it you're releasing the tension on the sear mm -hmm. so it's barely grabbing as it is as of right now with that rifle so so like the outdoors says it does pass the drop safe test okay cool yeah but i mean uh, if they're selling the trigger i mean i mean i it's got a you know for liability reasons it, it did about have to be drop safe or you know yeah That'd be for <laughs> this side. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're going to take it out hunting. I mean, this is a rifle that folks are, are considering for the cost for hunting uh, reasons. You know, you're going to be up in your blind. Um, I mean, there, there's those instances where the rifle falls out of your blind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I really wasn't comfortable sharing with what I did. I mean, I, if anybody wants to know, I'll pretty much tell you. But just to put a video up on YouTube, here's how you fix your trigger. I mean, there was just such a fine line of adjustment. I just, I didn't feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt the same way too, but I don't know if I just put that disclaimer on there to kind of show. <laughs> um, but you know, it's YouTube. I mean. Yeah, there's. There's people out there that are going to take that <laughs> and do all sorts of things. So, you know, but, hey, um, natural selection, I guess. I don't know. That, that, is, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sad to say, but that's just uh, there's common sense involved, you know. So I think I think since the when was it the probably Christmas Eve, I've probably got well over a hundred comments on mainly Compass. I mean, every suggestion known to man as far as what I should do to the rifle, what I should do to the round bullets, powder, just I mean everything. And uh, I apologize if I haven't got back with you. I sat down for over an hour yesterday just kind of reading and answering comments, and I've got that many more today. Wow. It's a, it's, it's a popular topic. I think we picked the right rifle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think a lot of folks are just kind of on edge about what rifle to get, and they want to get, you know, they want to be within 300 bucks and push the limits of precision. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I think this rifle is definitely, definitely capable, especially with all the features you're getting. You're getting a five r barrel you know three, yeah three lug design i just not there's not many rifles out there that even have a three lug design you know um styers like the one the only rifles that i know of that come factory that way yeah most of the rifles so the bolt in mine was probably a little sticky when i first got it but you know i got 66 rounds and it's it's smoothed out it's, it's not a bad action right now yeah um that was one thing i was looking you know basically in, in the right receiver itself, since I, I know a little bit of machining and I used to do it myself, um, took it all apart looking for tooling marks. Because um, mm -hmm. I know for sure that this year, Smith & Wesson or Thompson Center was really pushing these out. Yeah. And I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, um, maybe a little bit on the back end of the bolt. Uh, but other than that, it's a pretty good machine rifle. Now the, uh, the Ruger American bolt, it sounded like a corduroy jacket when I got it, that bolt had major machine marks, but it was just, I mean, it wasn't really machine marks. It was just how it was machined. And, uh, you know, a lot of people use lapping compound. I had a little polishing bit and I kind of polished it out and took some extremely fine, like thousand or 2000 grit sandpaper and slicked mine up. And, uh, it, it smoothed that pretty nice. It was kind of funny that I, that I kind of hear, um, when I see people shoot the rifle, like JRB uh, or, or you, the Thompson Center Compass has this distinct locking. You can yeah. kind of hear it kind of clunky, you know? It sounds like a, like a clunk, you know? <laughs> it, I mean, I don't think it's a bad action. I think it's a pretty good action. And that was one of my concerns. I'm like, man, it sounds sloppy, but it actually is pretty dang tight. And to me, the, the stock feels, the uh, the Ruger American and my Savage Axis, them stocks are almost identical. I mean, they are, the, the contour, the everything about them. This one, to me, has got a lot more meat up front. But it, it, to me, it, it, it isn't truly lined up with the barrel. It does lean a little bit. And I took it out and I kind of feathered the uh, edges with some sandpaper. I, I won't say I opened it up, but I took that corner off of it a little bit and it helps. It. It's free floated. There's, there's plenty of room. But as far as running it with a bipod, I think it does better than, than the Ruger American does. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Um, it, it doesn't flex as much. I mean, mine has lots of fiberglass in it and everything else, and this is completely stock, and, and it's about the same as it right now. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did exactly what you're saying, um, but I use the Uncle Jim's method of uh, just getting your wrist or your knife and this shaving mm -hmm. just to get it better. Because um, I noticed when I preloaded the uh, the rifle with the bipod that it really bent it in. And um, I had this out there with me. So, yeah, yeah this thing does come in handy. Yeah. And uh, what I was doing, I had this on the barrel and it was definitely uh, barely passing it. So, um, Anthony, or am I looking at Anthony? Anthony's Adventure says, when do you think more? aftermarket parts will pop up for the compass, mainly stocks. I would say there ought to be a huge aftermarket following here shortly, as many rifles as they've sold. Um, you know, the Ruger American, the Axis, you can get a MDT chassis for them. I could possibly see them offering one. Um, yeah. I really think going forward, uh, there ought to be some stuff coming out for it. Yeah, most definitely. And I'm pretty stoked that Boyd's, uh, like Brian has said, um, has that varmint stocks, has more of that pistol grip style. Yes. Um, I really wish they came out with AT1, a AT1 stock for it. Yeah. Uh, I have that Pro Varm on my 22, and I love that stock. That is the perfect stock. I mean, the contour, everything, the, the pistol grip vertical part, the, the cheek rise on it, everything is, it is a very nice stock. Yeah. Yeah. My only thing is, um, for me, if I get the Varma stock, it looks still kind of traditional, uh, low cheek weld uh, for that low access uh, scope. Um, but there is aftermarket cheek risers where you could drill through it and then yeah. make your own little riser. So. Yeah, that Matthews Fabrications where I got the one for my Ruger. And I mean, he makes them for about everything or he can custom make you one. So uh, you might check him out if you're interested in one of those. Yeah. Do you plan on getting one of those stocks in the future for? Or? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I like to keep this as budget as I can for right now. And then, you know, I just want to see it perform out of the box. That's yeah, kind of my goal. Yeah. That's my yeah, goal. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty pretty happy that we both got these rifles and, and uh, you know, we're doing some load development together because it, it just helps out, you know. It cuts back some time, too. Yeah. I'm not saying that and, we're going to use each other's loads, but it gives us a general idea yeah. of where to start it. Yeah, I mean, if a load shoot's good for you, I know I want, if I want to try that bullet, I can try it. You know, you've yeah. done the initial workup. And I think Ocean's going to be doing quite a bit of probably cast bullet work on his. So, and that, that NOE mold he got, that's a good looking bullet. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I, I really want to see what that does for him because I was considering that mold as well. Um, I think for him, it's going to work out. I think he told me that his uh, longest range is 300 yards. Yeah. Um, so, is exactly what Jamie's saying. That's that's where you can get your challenge for reloading. You can get your get your, uh, I guess your, your stick, uh, you know, settled from uh, all the all the cast work and is doing load development that way for precision. You know. Oh, <laughs> Wes says the shooter's on now. He told me he's watching both our videos. Yeah, how can you watch them both at the same time? <laughs> oh yeah, man, you gotta be talented if you got two going like that. That's yeah, like a multitasker there. <laughs> so I might talk a little bit about my uh, SWFA scope. I've got a lot of comments on how I like it. Um, I haven't shot it past 100 yards yet, but everything so far, clarity's been there. It's handled the uh, those 125 SSTs. It's grouping well. So, you know, everybody's like, well, check your scope, check your base. I mean, all that's good on mine. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. But uh, it seems like it's going to be a good scope. Yeah, I, I thought about getting the 20 power um, just because, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit odd. Uh, I think I'm maybe similar to you. I like seeing more of the target at long range. My my issue is, I, I mean, shooting by myself, I'm spotting my own shots. And, I mean, I would be perfectly comfortable with a 10 or 14, but you you just can't see that much, and especially at 1,000 yards. I can't hardly see the splashes out there. And yeah. uh, you get to that 20 power range, and you can see you're, you're not missing much with it. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. If you're just out in regular – regular desert land like where I'm at, it's hard to see those splashes. You I love them. your your mountain you shoot against. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I'm hoping to get a, a camera pretty soon to kind of zoom into it because yeah. that powder, it's like silt. It, it's yeah. cool, man. It, yeah, you can really see the impacts. Um, I'm actually stoked that I found that road. The funny part about that road is that it actually leads up to a desert bar. Huh. You going, yeah, you go up all the way up the mountain, and it's it, you have to have a four by four to get there. But they call it uh, Desert Bar 2.0, um, <laughs> and during MMA fight nights, uh, that's where a lot of our locals go. Yeah, and you're talking about a bucket of beer for three bucks, so you can tell kind of yeah, <laughs> about partying. There's partying for sure. 
<laughs> so did 1.0 burn down or something? Or yeah, yeah. It, at one time, um, they didn't have their liquor license, so they were kind of they got caught by BLM. So <laughs> there's a they're on the newspaper, and then you know, like I said, the locals are the only ones that know about it. And since I'm a local now, I kind of uh, got in the mix. Yeah. But um, the guy actually told me, he says, you know what? You really want to reach out there? Well, you shoot off my patio. I said, all right. Yeah. I said, no, I arranged it out with a GPS. Oh, shoot. Four miles? Uh, <laughs> I don't got a cartridge I can reach out there yet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. So West Desert Shooter said he started with a 20X, but now thinks the 16 is the best choice. The 12X is easier to get in the eye box, and the 20 is picky. I will agree with that. You have to have your eye relief just about perfect. It doesn't have that that give that some other scopes have. Yeah, I, I could agree, too. I got the 16X, um, and I'm finding it actually to be a perfect balance, like what he's saying. At 1,500 yards, I was actually able just to barely move the dot um, and get precision that way. So I still have enough of a, a view to um, see the target and uh, as well as splashes. But the eye box, like they're saying, it's it's pretty finicky. I'm pretty happy with the scope. But the tracking on it is yeah. perfect. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, stretching this one out. I, I'm still not used to this reticle because I'm used to that Cytron, the hashes every two minutes. I mean, I mean, this one's a little more busy for me. I'm getting used to it. I just, I haven't spent a lot of time behind it, getting familiar yeah. with it. I, I messed around with it at 1,000 yards just to see, okay, because I've been working on getting the first round impacts, uh, just, just so I know my ballistic app is uh, actually um, dead on. And I noticed that when I have a splash, you could count the minutes of angle over with the hash marks. Yeah. And it's, all right, boom, two, two minutes, of, you know, two minutes of angle, dial left, and it's, it's pretty yeah. dang close. So. And, and that's what, you know, people ask me, you know, MOA or mil, which I have both. And I mean, you're just measuring in the scope on, you know, from where you're aiming to miss it, and then you're making your adjustment. It really doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a, it's a type of measurement. Yeah. Yeah, and it all depends. I, and when people ask me, should I go MOA or MIL? Um, a lot of, I guess, folks that were in the service prefer MIL because that's what they were taught. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I would go with what makes sense more to you and what you feel more comfortable. For yeah. me, you know, 10 inches at 1,000 a, a yards, that, that's that's really easy for me to kind of judge and dictate what that is. Yeah, so and, like you know, I, I'm, I'm used to these MOA reticles. I mean, I just, I really like them. That's, that's kind of, I guess, the terms I think of. Some of those, you know, Christmas tree reticles with all the dots and everything. Yeah. I just, I don't like those. They're too busy. There's too much to look at. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was looking at those new Vortex. Uh, it's their, um, it's the cheaper line. What the hell? So there's a Crossfire? Yeah, it, they came out with the new ones, a 6x24. Yes. Yeah, only 300 bucks. Um, I looked into that scope as well, uh, but like you're saying, it's a little bit too busy. Um, the other issue with a lot of those scopes are they don't have a ton of adjustment. A lot of times you just get, you know, 50, 55 minutes. And if you're going to, you know, shoot up to a thousand yards, you really have to get some uh, scope adjustment to get all that. <laughs> yeah. And the West Desert Shooter brought that up with my uh, a review on the CV Life. I totally forgot about that because um, that was another good benefit with these little cheap scopes that I have that I've been rocking out. The CV Life has about 60 minutes of uh, adjustment, yeah. which I'm pretty, pretty amazed because it's a one in eight. Um, like based one and eight uh, click per, per, per oh eight per, yeah yeah so it's a lot finer but it still has sixty minutes so I'm like wow okay um, if it tracks the way it does I haven't one thing I haven't done with it is ran it all the way up and it ran it all the way back down and from what I've read that's where a scope kind of loses its tracking it's cheaper cheaper uh, West Desert Shooter said Diamondback Tactical I think that was the twenty four power one wasn't. It? Yeah, the Diamondback series. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I mentioned this a few times, but if, there, if anybody is wondering what zoom they need to get, say, for instance, you do have access to long range, I always point this video out, but Wes as a shooter does an awesome, awesome job pointing that out, showing different scopes at different distances. So uh, if you guys are wondering about that, definitely check that channel out. Uh, check that video out. I think that was the video that set his channel on fire. I mean, his yeah. channel exploded after that video. Yeah, it did. Well, it well deserved, man. That was a pretty good topic, you know. So uh, Anthony's adventure said primary arms 
uh mine's the early primary arms it's on my 243 and it's just the the first focal plane mill dot and and really that's been a good scope it served me well i've had a some tracking issues and and the main thing was back when i was shooting a thousand yards you know i dial up to a thousand then i'd go back to zero go back to a thousand go back to zero and over time my uh when i had it zeroed my uh point of aim at 100 yards would start drifting up i was two or three inches high and well, that kind of bugged me. I'd have to re-zero my turrets every couple of weeks, it seemed like. <laughs> Dusty's wondering who, who uses a Leopold scope. Um, I actually have a couple Leopold scopes. I got the VX3. Um, I just, I don't, I don't use it because it's kind of sentimental. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's my uncle's. So I've used cool. some older models and they was fixed powers. I think they was about a fixed 12. And I mean, they're, they're pretty good scopes. I mean, they don't make junk. That's what I always tell people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Leopold, Leopold, but you're you're going to pay for it. You know? Yeah, and and their lifetime warranty. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter if it's the first scope they ever made, and you found it at a rummage sale. They they'll warranty it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but like you're saying, you know, we're we're budget minded. You know, we just like to show people that you could definitely get into this art, this sport, or. A lot less than you think. I had a I had a comment. I don't know if I some some comments that get pretty bad. I delete or whatever. But I think this one's still up. But he, but a guy told me he said if, the best thing I could do was throw my Ruger American away. <laughs> oh my gosh! You proved him wrong. <laughs> I just chuckled and laughed. I was like, okay, this is probably you know one of the top ten shooting six fives in the world. Yeah, it is. It isn't that good, but you know it, it's a good shooting rifle. No, I, you would have sold that story after that long range shooters of Utah challenge, man. I'm still amazed by that, dude. Honestly, it's just freaking amazing skill you have for uh, shooting that far. And uh, with a budget rifle, it, it is it's it amazes me because I go to Ben Avery quite a bit on uh, over there in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of sponsored F class shooters there with rail with rail guns. You talking about rifles yeah. that are custom made, sixteen thousand dollars rifles. You know, they look over and see a guy with a Savage, and they're like. Pfft. You know, they kind of scoff at you. <laughs> I know exactly what they're feeling. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I think the first comment, someone asked me what I was shooting, and I told them, they're like, are you serious? I said, yeah, you brought that here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then we're rocking out. <laughs> and by the end of the weekend, everybody was talking to me. I mean, they just wanted to know my setup and all this. And, yeah, you know, I'm. I haven't really shot that many like teeny tiny groups. Like a lot of these, once I get a rifle down to about half MOA, that's yeah. good enough. I'm I'm happy. I mean, I've shot my fair share of you know point three, point fours, but you know once I get to that half minute threshold, ragged holes, I'm happy. Yeah, exactly. You know, for you know for us, you, we just have fun hitting targets at long range. Um, you know, when you really get down the rabbit hole, as, as so to say. Uh, precision F class shooting, you want one ragged holes at 300 yards. You're, you're talking about that's where you jump up from. Okay, I'm going to spend a thousand bucks on a setup to 4,000. You know, yeah. you really get into the rabbit hole. And then your reloading equipment just starts going skyrocketing. You know, yeah. um, unfortunately, that's where you pretty much have to get rid of all your lead stuff. Yes. And start going with like, uh, what do you call those um, uh, arbor presses? And yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, JRB just put that video on that, what was it, 6 PPC or whatever, and, and yeah, that's pretty impressive. That was the first time I'd really seen an Arbor Press use reloading. I, I knew people used them, but I'd never seen those kind of dies or anything used before. And, and you know, for yeah. the first time out with that rifle for him, it was shooting very well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Six millimeters has been known to shoot ragged holes. Just yeah. to do just a good balance of that rifle. Long, skinny, uh, a bullet. Yeah. Um, really, yeah. I want to talk a little bit maybe about the those uh, solid copper rounds. So oh, yeah. I released the video going two to 500 yards. You know, they shot pretty good. And then I actually took them out to 1,000. Um, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. And I don't have a video on it, but my problem, it was super calm out. But those copper rounds hitting the steel, they didn't hardly make no sound. And I couldn't hear it. Yeah. And, uh, and the ballistic calculator, those copper rounds act a little different. Out to, you know, four or 500 yards, your data is right on. But it, it, I don't know, the ballistic calculator and a lead bullet and versus a copper bullet is different. And what it was telling me to dial at a, at 1,000 was way off. It was like three mils off. 
So it took me four. I only had 14 rounds. It took me four or five rounds to get on target. And I actually heard one impact with my earmuffs cranked all the way up. There was zero wind yesterday. And I think I ended up putting five or six. In, I think they was all in a row on my camera on target, but I had no knowledge. I had no clue I'd even hit it. And <laughs> it just, you know, an 80 grain copper bullet. And it just, just barely makes a noise. Yeah. Maybe this doesn't have that weight to kind of give it a, a good yeah. thud. Yeah. Um, I know when I was watching your video, I don't know, I thought you were trying to make a Jingle Bell song out of it because <laughs> all I hear was just steel smacking. Um, you know, I drive a lot, and what I do is I, I set the video off to the side and I listen, you know? Yeah. So that's how I watch a lot of my videos. So <laughs> just, just hearing the steel impact, as you went down to 500 yards, I'm sitting there, yeah, I got the earbud pushed to my ear. I'm like, yeah. is it oh, there it yeah. is. It, it was a lot quieter than a lot of the videos. It was, yeah. I was really surprised on those copper copper bullets. And on that uh, that thousand yard target, it was only making about a three sixteenths mark on it. It was very, it was barely marking the steel. Because huh. I, I, I had all these hits, and I'm thinking, you know, two forty three usually leaves you know a nickel size mark on it or so. And I had all these little, they was just specks or whatever. I was like, well, yeah. it's got to be. And I played the camera back, the target cam, and, you know, that was it. And it was just, you know. That's good and there's a lot of uh, competition shooters that go with copper bullets. Yeah. Got, I mean, it makes sense. Everything's CNC'd. Everything is true spec. I mean, so. Yeah, God, every round in that box was identical. There was no variation in weight. I had a, a bullet comparator on them, overall length. Every one was exactly the same. Wow. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, but just, just having 50 rounds, I just didn't have the amount of rounds to really work up a good load. I just kind of got a, you know, a, you know, a one MOA load and then had to go with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that works for even a thousand yards. You got a 24 inch plate. You're, you're going to yeah. get it. Yeah, I'm running 36. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was wondering what, what kind of plates are those AR five hundred steel or just miles? All my steel is AR five hundred except for that thousand yard one, and that thousand yard is just three sixteenths mild steel. Oh yeah, I was wondering. It dented up pretty good. Yeah, that that six five puts a decent little dent in it, but it, it's all right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. As long as it doesn't poke, poke a hole through, I think you're good. Yeah, at uh at seven fifty, repeated hits will poke a hole in it, but once you get up to a thousand and farther, it's fine. Oh okay. Um, well, I thought about buying a plate for long range, but I was like, well, I really at that velocity, you're not really going to have that much power, you know? Yeah. So, uh, good night, uh, Tim. I see you're going to bed. <laughs> oh, he's turning in early, huh? Yeah. We should have made this a hat night. He would have been on. Yeah, I know. I think Tim probably counts unicorns instead of counting sheep at night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> yep. That, that's going to stick for him for a while, man. Unicorn does. Yep. <laughs> uh, I can't wait till next Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't get mad. Like I said, I get even. I still got freaking flecks of uh, glitter here, so it's it's embedded in my table. I was at my uh, grandparents' uh, Christmas Eve night, and all my little cousins were talking about all these unicorns they was getting. I was like, well, it must be big with the kids, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's pretty funny, though. Uh, he told me that, what is it, it was a... Uh, Oh, was, oh, no, it was Preacher that started it. Yes. Pon Pony Baloney. Pony Baloney. Um, <laughs> Little Birdie told me that Preacher and I think uh, Ozark and Loads of Bacon are going to be uh, doing some hunting pretty soon. Yep, I think they're probably heading out now. There was uh, there were several to go, I believe. So. Okay. I was wondering... Do you see a glare on my screen for some reason? I keep seeing like over light exposure. Hey, right now it looks good. So okay. Yeah. Uh, Anthony's Adventure said muzzle brakes or comps on your Thompson centers. Are you seeing much of a difference? I saw the video, but not sure what the ver verdict was. Um, mm -hmm. As far as mine, I bought the cheapest thing I found on eBay. It was fourteen dollars in free shipping. <laughs> uh, it came with a jam nut. I wanted a jam nut over the crush washer. Recoil is reduced. It's working fine. It still kicks a little bit to the left. That that's my only complaint with it. It's not as bad as it was without it, but and I haven't shot at long range yet to know exactly. You know, keeping the target in the scope after you shoot, how it's going to be. Yeah, but uh, it, it's working. Yeah, I did the same thing too. I went to eBay and just typed in you know five eighths by twenty four 
uh, comp, and I ended up running into this comp here, and it's a pretty nice looking comp. I was, yes. My only concern was all the ports up top. Um, you know, a lot of comps that the way they're designed, like the professional comps, they don't really have mo much porting on top. And the reason for it is because when you shoot the barrel, you don't want all that pressure pushing the barrel down and spring it back up. Um, when the harmonics go through it, it goes back and forth at least 20 times. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit of pressure, they'll kind of deviate, push it down, uh, you know, uh, fractions of a, uh, fractions of an inch will cause yeah. a little bit of time to change. Yeah, here's the, my break. It's just, it's not tapered or nothing like the one on my Ruger American. It's just the three chamber and then it's got the uh, three holes on top. But it, yeah. it's just the basic style. I thought, you know, that's worth a try. And it's actually a, a also rated for a 338 Lapua. So it's got a little bit bigger hole on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm actually kind of, I like that because my 6.5 break is actually a 308 break and it's performed really well. So I was thinking I might as well try, you know, keep my luck going, try kind of an oversized break on the 308. Yeah, I, I did the same thing too. Um, I bought the Sansa Co. Omega break. Uh, but I don't know what's called the name brand, but it's, it's one of their suppressors. That's what I had traditionally on the 6.5 Creedmoor. And I swapped it. I actually bought two of these breaks. And I found this break that actually worked a lot better. Um, what I've been doing is shooting some slow-mo videos to kind of see what it does. And um, I'm pretty surprised. You know, I bought this thing for 35 bucks, and they're, it's going. It's barely moving the rifle, and it's keeping it straight back. And that's what yeah, you want. that's what you want. I mean, and mine's mine's still kicking a little sideways. So yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, James Pollard asks, "Is it the comp or the twist?" And I guess that's if you're wanting to know why my groups have been so bad and. <laughs> I'm 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 thinking it's more of the bullet weight slash twist more than anything. Uh, I was reading some reviews. There's a, a Facebook page for the Thompson Center Compass, and I've only found one person shooting a like 168 or heavier bullet on there. So I think that's that's telling me something. Yeah. Now this is a one in twelve twist, right? Yes, it is a twelve. Okay. Um, my 30 out six is also a one in 12, and I'm kind of wondering because that rifle really loved the 208 grain ELD. Uh, yeah. That's a pretty heavy round, so I was like, yeah. well, I'll give it a try. This and you're probably it. getting a little more velocity with that 30 out six. Yeah, I think, you know, the one, the round I developed was a 168 grain, but I was roughly a 27, I think 27, 60 FPS, if I can recall. So I'm right there, you know, with yeah. the load I have now. So I, I just, I kind of think that maybe just these bullets like to be pushed hard and fast. Yeah. So, Curtis, you don't want me shooting north because if I drift just a little bit east, you're in danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think you're right. I think the 150 is probably going to be uh, yeah. uh, where to go to. So. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with that 150, 155 range. I mean, I can, I can do what I want to do with that grain. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's all I want is basically a thousand thousand yard rifle. But I'll push it. I'll push it out if I can, twelve hundred yards, and see where it starts dropping off at. Uh, Logan wants to know what's your elevation there. Um, well, I don't have that twenty MOA base like you do. Well, elevation of the land. Of the land. Oh, oh. Um, sorry. Uh, two thousand, I believe. So you're you got a little bit of elevation. Yeah, I'm up in the hill a little bit. What's kind of weird is I can go down the hill. It doesn't feel like you're going down the hill to the lake area. That's sea level. Really? Yeah. So I have this. Ooh. I mean, I think I'm right there at 2,000. Yeah. Yeah, we was talking about that. I think on Uncle Jim's chat the other day because I'm at like uh, 457 or something or whatever. I'm pretty low, but if you think I'm not far from the Mississippi River either, so I mean. Okay. You know, I was going to ask you too. When you went to the long range shooters of Utah, they seem like they're up in elevation. Did you notice your rounds kind of changing impacts or? Uh, major major change. It was uh, the range was sixty five hundred feet elevation. Wow. Okay. Um, at a mile, it was like twenty MOA difference from shooting at home. Really? That big of a difference. What about your loads that you developed? Did it, did it hold group or anything? Yes, the loads worked well. Um, I run the numbers here before I left, like with my elevation and theirs. And then I got there the day early, so I, I, I could practice that day. And, and, you know, that was the the key to verifying it. And I think my mile 
was around 73 MOA. And you know, in, in, I'm thinking in my head home, I've been anywhere from like 89 to 95 MOA to shoot a mile. And I'm dialing 73 there. You know, the first shot, you know, blowing dust right there by the target. So, I mean, that, and yeah. it, it's easier. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny that you say an 88. That's, that's what my next elevation uh, hold is going to be. And I'm, I'm pretty much maxed out on the scope and I'm holding over on with the SWFA. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's it definitely, it's kind of funny to say that 200 yard difference right there at 1500 yards is really dropping off that bullet. Um, I couldn't believe I actually hit 1500 yards. I was just kind of amazed how tight that group was. Yeah. And the, the first round impact, that is the greatest <laughs> feeling in the world. Cause you're, you know, you're, you're kind of uncertain. You got it all dialed and let's see where this one goes. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a funny feeling because at first I'm like, well, I don't know if I hit it, but I saw that tie strap do this. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought I hit the tie strap and, my neighbor was with me. He had his vortex spotting scope. It was like it was all set up. Like it yeah. was perfect when when I saw him out there. Now, could you hear the impact of, at a mile? No, you can't. No. Not at all. Um, I didn't know if the if the wind if the wind was right, you probably could. But yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, my elevation is one thousand four forty seven. So okay, that's where I'm at. Um, but yeah, I I wish I could hear the impacts. Uh, I probably need a better camera. I need to get a better camera that I can zoom in, and that way I, I can kind of see. Because um, it, it's hard to see, especially when you hit behind the plate where it just comes up and over. Yeah. You don't see your dust trace that good. So, so I bought this crazy. Canon camera. Oh, it's been about two years ago. And I, I bought it, you know, so I could really had a really good zoom and I could use and I never had any luck with it. And every time I'd video with it, it'd video for like 10 seconds and shut off. And I pretty much just gave up. Well, I bought a new memory card for it and it fixed it, I guess. I guess the card wasn't fast enough. So I've kind of got a, a long range camera again I can use. I've been playing with it just a little bit now. <laughs> Uncle Jim and his emoji, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how he finds those emojis, but okay. Uh, I've seen him on his iPad before, you know, and, and, and instead of a keyboard, he just has emojis. There's no letters. <laughs> oh, I get what he does. He probably sets his keyboard to have. Uh, every letter is an emoji, so he probably gets the stickers. <laughs> I got you. Makes sense now. We got a New York City reloader out there. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, definitely. Um, talking about that silencer, I, I'm actually really stoked and excited to get it, but I, I'm wondering if it's going to cause more recoil. I, I don't Generally, know. you they reduce recoil. From what I, I mean, I have zero experience in that, but you know, they say that's one of the best brakes you can buy. Okay. Yeah. I got it because I thought it'd be an investment, but it was, it was, it was pricey. I mean, the wife was yeah. not happy. I would, <laughs> we were so close like two years ago to getting them here in Illinois. I mean, it was like, we're getting them, we're getting them. The governor was on board yeah. and still carry got passed. They was kind of gun minded. And then one of those shootings and it was over, not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> we got a new governor coming in next month and it's not going to be good here. Yeah. I, it was funny. I came home one day. I was like, "Hey, um, I bought a silencer." And she's like, "I could tell." <laughs> money. I was like, "Hey, because uh, she was pissed, right? She was pissed." I was like, "Well, hey, um, I need you to come down here with me so I can do some fingerprints <laughs> for the trust." So the whole ride there. Oh yeah, you are talking about walking on eggshells? Um, I'm trying to bribe her. Hey, you want to stop by Ross over here? Maybe get. <laughs> Hey, Did you, you tell her about the uh, tax stamp? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah. That was another thing too. And so we did the trust. I got to do the tax stamp too. And she, yeah, she about she about lost it on me. But um, she's a good supporter and uh, got over it. It just, it just took a couple QVC purchases. What I what I hate is I'm like 40 miles from Indiana. Go to their gun shop. Suppressors laying around, and it's just like I'm so close. <laughs> <laughs> Those, just, those silencer code kiosk, uh, I could definitely say it, it made that my experience really, really easy. Um, Ozark, I think, was the one that recommended, as well as Uncle Jim. And uh, definitely, it was a lot easier process. We yeah. just had to drive quite a bit. Because so. when, when it was, you know, hot and heavy talk here, I'd actually, there's really no uh, Class 3 FFLs here. There are a few just for law enforcement purposes. 
you know, there's one in like extreme Southern Illinois, then up around Springfield some, and I'd actually been in contact with one. I was like, say this passes, you know, I want to buy one off you or whatever. It was kind of getting things in line and then it never happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, my main reason why I wanted a silencer is one, I got a coyote problem over here and I really don't want to wake my neighbors up. Um, and two, th there's a lot of competitions that I kind of want to get involved. Um, you know, uh, three gun IPSC. They also have a, a F class shooting. They don't. They don't allow you to have muzzle brakes. Which yeah. Makes sense, you know, it's because you're going to be distracting your fellow uh, shooter there. So I really they said, okay, either crown target or muzzle or or uh, um, silencer. Yeah. So, and um, that's my main reason. I want to get more into competition. I just feel that I could probably, you know, feel like I could better improve my skills. Yeah. Um, the shooting. I I enjoyed that NRL 22. It's just, it's an hour and 20 minutes one way for me to go shoot. I generally work Friday nights. I don't get home to one, two, and lately I've been working a lot of 12 hour shifts and, you know, I got to be on the road by six forty-five, seven o'clock, you know, to be there on time. And it just, it got where it wasn't that much fun. I mean, I may pick back up when the spring, once the weather gets nice, but I mean, it's just a long way to go. <laughs> uh, uh said the, the best reason to have a suppressor is the giddy giggle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's right. So, when I was out at Utah, that was my first experience ever hearing a suppressor or anything. I'd never been around one or anything. And, you know, a guy shooting a 338 Lapua with a suppressor, and it was just like, Psh! and oh. that was it. It was crazy. Wow. I didn't think about a suppressor that much. But, I mean, we was a distance, a little bit of distance away. But, I mean, it was it was just crazy, the sound. I never I never heard one in person before, and oh. especially for a big caliber like that. <clears throat> It's funny, it says about a giddy giggle. I was actually at my old range back in SoCal. I, these guys, I, could, I don't know. <laughs> it's California, so you don't know, you know. They're gigg they giggling, so I don't know if they're a couple. Anyways, um, they were laughing their butt off. I see him screwed on his muzzle brake. They had a three in a wind mag, and he set one round off, and it just echoed the whole range. I was like, what the hell was that? I guess he got one of those um, those uh, muzzle brakes that enhanced the sound. On, on a, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. They make stuff like that. Yeah, they there's these can things they put on the front, and I don't know. It it makes the blast go more forward, but it it makes it louder. It's like a megaphone, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> after about uh, two shots, the range officer called a ceasefire. And said to go home, pretty much like don't shoot that again, because I can't freaking hear anything. <laughs> like over the intercom, it was pretty funny. So uh, Dusty Bowhunter wants to know what I do for a living. I've never really said online or anything, but I do work for Walmart, but I do not work in a store. I'll just leave it at that. Nice. Yeah, everybody knows what I do. You guys, <laughs> you guys watch you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, I love my job. It, it's it's fun, especially when you get to be your own boss. But um, you, you know, it, it takes motivation. You know, you, yeah. you can really stray off the deep end and slack off. And yeah. I always been one to work hard, and that's just been my work ethic. So the uh, the good thing about me, I work a four day work week. Usually supposed to work ten, you know, four days, ten hours a day. But lately, we've been pretty busy. But get three day weekend. I think in what have I been there? 13 years I've worked one day of overtime. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately for me, I, I'm on call um, majority of the time. So I am good. has been there. You know, I just, he goes on trouble call with me during hat chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've been on a few of your uh, calls. <laughs> yeah. You're there. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty fun experience. Middle of the desert. Um, I don't know. I, I had a couple of coyotes come up to me. I don't know if the locals are just uh, feeding them or making them friendly or what, but I don't know. I've been, we and my brother went out, oh, about a week ago trying to call on some coyotes. We got some ground that they farm or whatever that he shot one last year. We got the, uh, the Primos turbo dog call, the, the decoy, the whole nine yards. And, and we had a good snow on last year, good and cold, set that thing up. I hadn't even got to where I was going yet. And I heard a gunshot and he'd already shot one. I mean, we hadn't been there like three minutes and he'd already shot one. I know. And uh, we got back and we set up the other day and called and called and called. We never seen nothing. Then we went to a second spot and never seen nothing. But 
They seem to be pretty smart. I, I know West as a shooter was out on the coyote hunt. I don't know if he got lucky. I'd like to ask him if he uh, went back out there, but yeah, they're they're freaking smart. I'll tell you that. They, either they watched in the hills or something because I had um, <clears throat> I had hot dogs on the grill when I was out there dry camping, and um, came back thirty minutes later and they were gone. Yeah, I mean the whole grill was knocked over. I'm like, what the hell? But I've called in dozens of coyotes, and it's like they always circle me, or they they come in from behind me, or you know I'll get set up. You know they're going to come in this way, and they never do. They're always. It doesn't matter which way I'm facing. I might as well just turn around because that's where they're going to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, NYC says he feeds the coyotes a lot, lots yeah. of lead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you knew how much lead I slung at one last spring, <laughs> I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> oh, that's I, couldn't I, get, I couldn't get any closer than like 350, 400 yards from it. And all I had was my AR. So I'm, I'm <laughs> using, you know, the, the dots as holdovers and I'm blowing dirt up everywhere all over it. And I mean, they wasn't too scared of me, but. <laughs> yeah. So that's why they're banning bump stocks. So animal cruelty here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my brother, he's a he's a farmer anyway, but he was out putting anhydrous on and he calls me, he goes, There's coyotes everywhere out here. So so I run out there and he's like spotting from the tractor, you know, there's one here and one there. And yeah. Um, I've heard of, there's a lot of groundhogs up there in Illinois. Is, is that true or yeah, at, at times, um back in the 70s, uh my dad talks about they had a bounty on them where uh you killed them, you cut their ear off, and you got like two or three dollars. Okay. And, uh, I mean, they hunted them heavy back, I guess, in the 70s. And, uh, you know, they come and go. Uh, there's several uh, people still, I don't think they're worth nothing. They're just people shoot them because they do a lot of damage. Yeah. yeah they're, they're meaty bastards. I shot That's one one time. Uh, it come out of its hole, you know, and, and they're fairly tall, you know, but they're yeah. standing up out of the hole. It's like 18 inches. And he was, this was before YouTube, but I think I had a 243. And, 200, 250 yards. I just put that crosshair on his head, you know, and I don't know what the bullet drop was, but I mean, I blew him out of that hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the 17 HMR, that's what I remember shooting when I was a little, little younger um, for groundhogs. I was over there in Kansas in the Missouri side. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I remember it was a little bit of snow on the field. So there were still patches of snow. And the farmer came out there and asked us, what do you guys shoot? And I told him 17 HMR. That's the only thing I had. And um, he told me, well, all right, I'll be right back. He went down to Wally World, bought up all the 17 inch bar. <laughs> and a, um, I was only 20 at the time. He didn't know I was not 21. And uh, bought a box of beer. And my, brother, my brother was with me. I just remember this day. I mean, it looked like D Day. I mean, like I said, at first I was all white. And it was like a, like, a, like a Disney story, man. It's, you know, pretty scene, old background, sunlight just coming up. End of the day, it was pink. <laughs> pink. So <laughs> I had a ball with that one, but uh, he had a big problem with his cows. Exactly what you're saying. It's, it's they cause damage, and and the cows are just. Uh, I guess yeah, three or four cows get hurt because of those things. Yeah, that's like the uh, prairie dogs out west. They bore, bore the holes, and the cows break their legs, and they're they're quite a problem. Yeah. Uh, John Sullivan's on here, and uh, he's been commenting on some videos. I think he just got on here. He said, getting home from work. Um, the only thing I did today with my 308 was I took some uh, Hornady 168 ELDs, and uh, these are the rounds I loaded up for my buddy's rifle. I thought, hey, I got them. I'll try them. They did not do very good. I had an inch and a half group and a two-inch group with them. So kind of leaning towards the 168s are still a little heavy, I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I'm kind of. I'm going to confirm that. I got some of the bullets from um, Kyle Lutz. He sent me some 172 Sierra or 173, I don't know what they're called. They're the green tips. These bad boys are here. Okay, so they're like a Sierra. Yeah, Sierra. Hey, okay, probably. Yeah, and I do have uh, a few of the 208 grain bullets left from. My 30 out six, so <clears throat> I don't know. I, I had to go to the store, the local here, and uh, get the 150s just so I could see. You know, I'm gonna try everything. Um, <clears throat> maybe do the Saturday method if if I see that 4064 is a good powder for it. Uh, James Pollard actually recommended 760, 
And yeah. Looking at the manuals, 760 isn't even mentioned until you get to like the 178 grain bullet. So, yeah, seven uh, seven forty eight is listed, but yeah, seven sixty. <clears throat> yeah, seven sixty is in the same burn rate as forty three fifty, so uh, that makes sense. The slower burning powder, you're going to need a uh, heavier bullet to get a uh, better burn. So I, I don't know. I just always like Margit. I don't know. I just yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to give up on it. I think it's a good powder. It is, and Margit Margit to me has given me some of the best groups out of all my rifles, um, except for the Creedmoor. I haven't tried on the Creedmoor yet. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. John Sullivan says the, the twist rate is sufficient for 168. And I agree with that. Um, Ocean shared the other day that little, I think it was on Burger's website. You put your uh, bullet weight, length, everything, and it'll tell you, you know, if it works. And, and I agree, 12 will work, but it just doesn't seem like this rifle's liking it. Yeah. Yeah. It's finicky. And Uncle Jim actually mentioned really, uh, on my video um, a trial, like on it, of a kind of try out a deresonator, which I, I thought. It's actually a pretty good idea because these barrels are very, very thin. Yeah. You know, um, I haven't ever tried one out, but I kind of feel like I don't know too much about it that I'm going to be wasting bullets. Yeah. You know? So I really, I, I think once I do find a load, I will kind of try that out and see what it does. I get one. Uh, let's see, he says, uh, have you tried 4895? The only two mm -hmm. powders I have on hand is Varget and CFE 223. That will work in 308. So. Yeah. I mean, I've been recommended I've been recommended yeah. almost every kind of powder. So I don't know. I may go out tomorrow and see what I can find. So the funny part is, is yeah, you could buy the rifle for 200 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. I spent almost double that with reloading supplies and, and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really went down the rabbit hole. Um, and that's why I really wanted to try those spear bullets. I mean, a 308 match bullet, 22 bucks for my $200 rifle. I just like, it's going to work. And yeah. it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. CFE 223, I was, and I, like you're saying, I'm not going to give up. I'll try it as well to see what it'll do. Um, I, I never really had luck with ball powder. That's just yeah. my experience. I, I just, know. I just love how it measures. It just, oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's butter. Um, I agree. I mean, it measures great. I just, for some reason, I don't know what what the what the key is or what what the uh, what the magic is about the ball powder, how to get it to work. But I've yeah. never gotten it to work on any of my rifles. I just, I don't have any experience with it yet. I bought it for the uh, the Cast two two three, and like I said, I've kind of abandoned that. And then it's like, hey, that'll work in three oh eight. So I've I've been working with it, and I I, I wish I had some more of those uh, one twenty five SSTs because I would have loaded some up with the CFE. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got 4895. That's another powder I plan on trying. Um, let's reloader 15. I, I have yet to see a, a see that on shelf here. I have reloader 17, but I think it's a little bit too, yeah. too slow. Um, and 15 so, and Bargit on the burn charts almost right there side by side. Yeah, and that's what I thought too. Is like if 15 is right there side by side, Bargit's got to work. And I just, you know, from my experience with Bargit, Bargit seems to work exactly where I'm at. It's when you're near compressed. It yeah. Just, for some reason, everything seems to come together right there. And, that worked and in that, that video, I was talking about those 125s, and it called for a 50 grain max, and 50 grain filled the case up to the top of the, the rim. I mean, it was a full case. So I backed down a half grain because there wasn't any room to put the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a, so that was the most compressed I'd ever done. I, I run 49 and a half as my heavy load, and it was like 3 sixteenths from the top of that case, it was all the empty space there was. Okay. Uh, Curtis is recommending um, a near near short jump in 44 grains at 4064. I've heard that. And then, you know what? I have this theory. It's kind of funny because every time everybody talks about the load, oh, don't use my load data. You always work up your loads. I agree. I, definitely, I agree. Um, the load manuals always kind of are on the safer side for, yes. you know, legal reasons. And it seems to me, as far as all my loads that I've developed, are always near the max charge. Um, and they always fall, like, for instance, your 6 by Creedmoor. It's very, very similar. Your yep. 4350 load is, is almost as spot on with mine. Um, and I, I kind of have a theory is the rifle and the barrels that we have are all, there's only, like, I think four manufacturers that produce uh, you know, chromoly steel and, you know, 41 or whatever steel they're using in our barrel. And um, I think the remarks about the same. Measuring grains has a load for you. 
Yeah, that jokester. <laughs> he told me his, his best groups are one-shot groups, no flyers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I was giving him crap, too. I was like, hey, I, I, don't, I don't ever see you shoot or even have a rifle. Do you even – are you <laughs> – <laughs> he just measures and grains. That's all he does. He measures and grains, yeah, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, man. my six five load. Uh, my book's the older Hornady book, which its max shows forty point nine grains, and then they revised it to forty one five. I mean, I'm loading up to forty two four right now, and I mean, I could still go a little bit more, but that that's the sweet spot right there. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna take Curtis's. Um, recommendation i think uh, my next loads i'm gonna work up i'm gonna get like i did see some 155 match bullets they had some burger match 155s i'll pick those up and i'll do a saturday test but i'm probably gonna start a little higher see i've been wanting to try the saturday but my chronograph just won't cooperate <laughs> no, no you know what yeah speaking of that yeah that maybe i should hold off too and get 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 the magneto speed um, I'm with you too. I, I can't really trust my chronograph right now, uh, especially with some of the numbers are spitting out, but I don't know. Um, the reason why I, I'm saying that is my six, five load. It's, it's showing like an extreme spread of like 60 or 70, mm -hmm. right? But the point of impacts aren't showing that. I mean, I can hold dead on, um, at a thousand yards and it's all, it's every single time it's right there. So uh, Uncle Jim, you need to watch uh, Eagle Eye's uh, Taco Challenge, and you'll understand how you shoot with a match or charcoal or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pyrodex, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually had to get rid of that because I made I made a whole jar full of black powder, and I just didn't <laughs> safe having it in my house, so. Uh, I made a big old mortar canister fireball thing. <laughs> you know, I, I looked online. It's funny what you can see on YouTube. You know, they want to bun, ban us gun, gun channels, but you can go on YouTube and put on there how to make a mortar firework. Yep. It'll tell you exactly what to buy, how to make it, how to make the shell. Yep. IEDs, anything's on there. <laughs> yeah. When I was in college, which I went to school for uh, criminal justice or whatever, and uh, the teacher actually offered us, well, he said he used to do this, extra credit if you brought in like a meth recipe off the internet. And oh, he said uh, people started doing it, but he, ha he had to uh, keep getting people out of trouble because the cops were uh, watching those websites and stuff. And, you know, they'd get a knock on the door, you know, and it's like, I'm doing this for college. And he goes, I had to quit doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a, um, a teacher that was uh, teaching electronics. And he, for his final, he told me, you will pass the class early if you can hack into a computer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I Uncle Jim, I have not shot any Match Kings. Match Kings. Um, these are, I think, these are what the, those Match Kings are, right? Yeah, I think that's the, the tip Match King, the TMK. Yeah, yeah. So, Kyle gave me these, and um, I would hate to, to waste it if it doesn't work, you know. And I like the uh, the tip match king in my two forty three. I think they're the ninety five grain. Uh, Logan kind of re recommended those a while back, and man, they shoot lights out in that two forty three. I bet, yeah. A lot of folks keep talking about burger bullets. I, I've had, I've yet to try any, but I haven't either. Um, I, I definitely will try some. I just, I just know that those ultra tip um, bullets are kind of finicky with their overall length. They, they like to be seated kind of near lands. Um, that's from what I was reading, you know? Yeah. And that's probably what we're going to be running into with these compasses is the jump on them. I think they're going to be kind of sensitive on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a little bit of a jump test with that 43 grain load, and that's how I ended up being 8,000s off the lands. I saw that, that with a 2.800 overall length, oh, yeah, two-inch groups all day, then I jumped up to um, – was it fifteen thousands off the lands, and you can see it significantly, significantly uh, tighten up. But a lot of times, like two eight forty is about as long as I want to go for a factory magazine. I know that fits in yeah. the Ruger American magazine, and that's usually what I keep the try to keep the load to. But I mean, I, on occasion, I do go longer, and we may have to. And I single feed these, so I could care less about the magazine. Yeah, don't they make a spoon or something for the mag where you can throw it on there and single feed them? What I have one. It's the uh, ragged hole single shot loading block. Oh, okay, okay. I need to check that out. Yeah. Um, 
And but it's, are, it's uh, 3D printed. Um, I've told Meg about these before. So he could make one of these pretty easy, but it's just the outside diameter of a magazine. It's got a little uh, clip oh. for uh, fastening it. It's got a channel in it. But it's very simple, and you just toss your round in and go. <laughs> I was wondering because um, I kind of learned the lesson the hard way. I saw you just throwing your rounds in there and, yeah. and, and closing it. Well, I did that a few times and shoot up a few rounds. But yes. <laughs> now, they sent me one uh, a while back for my Ruger American to try, and then they said if I ever get a compass to holler at them, and they'd send me one. So it's been about a year, and I said, hey, I'm ready for one. So they, they sent me one out. Okay. Uh, I think they're an Illinois company. They're not too far from me. They're up uh, just a little north of Springfield, I think. Uh, yeah, I'd definitely order one. Curtis gave me a link. I'm going to save that. Thank you. Yeah, I clicked on it, too. I don't know where it went, but it's on my screen somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's another thing about the compass. I, I guess we didn't really talk about. It does have quite a bit of room. Uh, these bullets are seated at 2.875. Oh, wow. And it's it's uh, still got quite a bit of room. Uh, you can see yeah. that. So I could actually go out all the way to where I'm touching the lands and even further. So, um, Meg, we was talking about the single shot loading block. Um, Ragged Hull is a company that makes them, but uh, pretty simple little design. Yeah, I almost bought I almost bought a, a two compasses, one chambered and seven MMOE. I don't know if you ever have experience of that round. Uh -uh. Um, I like that round. It, it's uh, it's kind of soft shooting for me, um, but it, you get, for hunting round that does it all. Yeah. So I kind of want to play around with that and. Um, have a smith kind of open up the throat a little bit that way i could put some of those uh um eld bullets in there yeah right out i don't know what it is but i mean i've always shot hornady bullets i've always had good luck with them and then what little yeah. sierra i've shot i've been i've been very impressed with the sierra rounds and yeah you know, it seems like you know the, the hornady bullets are the cheapest and then sierra is a little bit more and then your burgers are even higher than that yeah, and that's that's exactly what you know what it is. it's just the budget you know these elds that seem to perform really freaking good um uh, they, they got it down how they tip their bullets and everything you know it almost looks like a cnc but um it, it's not perfect i mean i i've i still weight sort my bullets and i find them to be within point two of each other at least yeah. you know so that's that's pretty good for what it is um for the six millimeter i actually bought a mold that i was going to ask you if you could one day see what your bore diameter is. And the reason why is because this mold is a six millimeter um, bore rider mold. Basically the tip of the front end of the bullet is going to be riding in your bore. It's going to have to size down, the size of lead bullet down to your bore. Huh. And then the back, the back end is what's going to be your uh, ceiling pressure. Yeah. So that's going to be the size of 244 or whatever, you know. And uh, I, I kind of want to see what that'll do with the 243. Yeah. So maybe one day um, I'll cast those up when I get those and get those dimensions and send those off to you and see what you see what you can do with them. Yeah, because I mean that that two forty three of mine, I don't think it still should be shooting, but man, it shoots. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of rounds through it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and a lot of folks talk with uh, they say what six thousand rounds or four thousand rounds of barrel life is diminished or something like that. Well, well, two forty three. Most of the time, you know, shooting the heavier, you know, 105 grain bullets is a thousand round and 1415 max. Now, the uh, 308, yeah, three, four thousand more. Yeah, but those exactly. little, those little barrels are just, uh, you know, barrel burners, they call them. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I'm seeing kind of in the Wildcat makes right now, there's a lot of companies that are turning into the 25 caliber. Yeah. Uh, and um, there's a 25 Creedmoor that's that's came out. And I uh, think there's another cartridge that's chambered in 25, but it's basically a good balance between the six millimeter and the six five. Yeah. A lot of places can't hunt with a 22 caliber, so you know you have the what 22 45 sharps, which is a 223 necked up to 25, which is similar to your what six by 45. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that I kind of I don't know. I'm always interested in those uh, wildcats. Um, I, I I checked out that uh, 22 Grendel. Yeah, and that's a Valkyrie screamer. It, it yeah, on on paper it beats Valkyrie left and right. Yeah, there's not many people out there shooting it, but the ones that are shooting it are getting ridiculous velocity. 
3,000 plus FPS. I know one guy I was watching on YouTube, he had a uh, custom 243 made, and it was a fast twist, one and six or one and seven. And I think yeah. like around seven, 800 rounds, he was rebarreling it. Oh, shoot. I mean, he's like, time you get your load developed and, you know, it broke in, you know, you're at 100, 150, 200 rounds. And I think it's kind of a competition gun, you know, a couple matches with 100 rounds, 150 rounds. And he's like, the barrel was junk. Wow. <laughs> but he was shooting like the 115, uh, what is it, DTAC bullets or whatever it is, those really heavy ones. Okay. Yeah. I've seen a lot of six millimeter shooters do the same thing. They have those Remington switch barrels. Mm -hmm. where they're, um, on field, they're switching their barrel out, and they got their trailer with a gun lead and all kinds of crap. Yeah. There. That's, that's dedication there. Yeah. <laughs> um, 10 rounds, I'm switching the barrel out. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> have you uh, done any cleaning to your compass yet or anything? Nope. Um, I haven't either. I looked down through it with a little cheap Amazon bore scope, seeing if there's any kind of copper fouling. And I could say that I haven't seen any. I'm actually yeah. really surprised. My barrel was very, very oily when I got it. Mo yeah, more than most. And I actually ran several dry patches through it, but that's all I've done to mine so far. Yeah. Yeah. I took my bases off after seeing your video. When you're yeah. Just and oh my gosh, that it was, thing was caked full of oil. Not to mention it was barely on there. Yeah, the, it seemed like how the two screws on each base, one was tight and one was just finger tight, it seemed like. Yeah, it seems like it, someone went there with a little drill, you know, a assembly yeah. line to put them together. That's the only thing I've heard horror cool. stories of people getting those guns and mounting their scope to it and shooting six, eight-inch groups. And <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> all the base it's like you have to take those off every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, honestly, I think I should get that 20 MOA base. I just didn't like how it kind of overhang the back, but it, that, that doesn't seem to bother you. Yeah, it, it's longer than I like, and and I think Logan said he'd actually cut some of his off on one of his. If oh. that scope was like my Citron, I think it would clear it okay, but, man, I, I couldn't adjust it for eye relief. There's only one position I can put that scope on that rail with low rings. Oh, man, yeah. And it's tight. It is, it, it's tight on the front and the back. Okay. Uh, do you plan on putting lead in your stock as well, or? Right now, I really don't, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, that's what's kind of cool. I think, about, like like you're saying, I'll, I'll keep it pretty much similar to you. Um, that way, you know, we could, when we're doing a load development, we're at least close to each other, you know? Yeah. But when I had that, when I first got that 6.5, I mean, my, my goal initially was to shoot a mile with it. I mean, that was what I was doing with it. I didn't care. I wasn't going to hunt with it. I didn't care if it weighed 80 pounds when I got done with it. I just wanted a, a good shooting mm -hmm. rifle. And, and I've actually took it out coyote hunting before, and it, it's a little heavier than I like. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's funny you say that because even, even when I was shooting 1,500 yards, that mile shot, I almost feel like it's impossible for me. But then you just got to go and try it. Yeah. No, you're, you're doing good at 1,500, and, yeah, it won't be that bad. Yeah. It's just finding the place to do it. Where, where I was shooting, the, the lay of the land's real flat, and uh, I was having trouble seeing the impacts in the ground. And actually, when I first when I first started getting my impacts, the, the ground had dried up, and I started seeing the impacts. And then then it was easy, kind of walking it on in. Yeah. But uh, if you're shooting against a big, out in the desert, against a backdrop or something, I don't think you'll have any trouble. Okay. Yeah, I always see channels like uh, 4AW, Mark and Sam after work. Yeah. Oh my god! That guy is shooting a forty-five seventy, two thousand yards. What the so, heck? Yeah, so the, port, <laughs> the Fort Scott rounds. I was watching a video on them the other day, and they have factory loaded ammo, six five Creedmoor, and they they set a world record a while back shooting factory ammo and a factory rifle, and they got like twenty, I believe, twenty four hundred yards with the six five Creedmoor. Wow. And uh, I was talking back and forth on email with one of their guys or whatever, and he go, I said something about your world record, and they's like, no, Mark and Sam have beat that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. And that, that's crazy with bot, bot and ammo. Yeah. I think a lot of it, what they're doing is they're up on the hill, so they got that elevation um, advantage. Mm -hmm. So they're able to dial over, and it just has a little bit more drop to get into the target. And she is an amazing spotter. <laughs> I know. She is, man. Just watching them, I'm like, wow, you know. I, I try to say, I try to show my wife, and she's like, hey, you want to do this with me? And she gave me a little finger. <laughs> No, that's stupid. And I mean, she gets excited as he does. <laughs> yeah, she does. And she's she's like legitly into it. And I'm like, and I kind of feel bad because I thought she would be shooting more, but I think she just likes doing what she likes doing. Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, that's that's what she enjoys, and, and she is good at it. And they always tell me, I mean, they say the better shooter should be the spotter. <laughs> right. That's yeah. the. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, I really like, uh, he actually came out with a video yesterday, and I was watching um, where he took all three of those out. He had the 6.5 Creedmoor, I think it was like 24 or 2,200 yards. 45 70, he shot at 1,800 yards standing. He's standing with his leg <laughs> lever gun. It's a leg lever gun. It's like it's a short barrel lever gun. Wow. And he's shooting that thing. And you can see the impact. It takes like what six seconds almost. Yeah. Something I may have to try an offhand shot at a thousand. I'd like to do that once or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, six five creed more. I think I think I could get one shot off and hit it. Jerry <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Mitchell like it. Yeah. I think I'd get my fling on and you know, get all get all comfy and I think I can get one shot and hit it. Which, which that I can hear it, so I'll know if I hit it. <laughs> Put that on the bucket list, man. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely want to try that, and uh, I always want to see if I can hit a nine mil long range. You know, I've shot. I want to think I've got two or three hundred before with a nine mil, just lobbing them in. I mean, thirty three round mag, and finally hitting one. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, twenty two planks for you with upside down or super yeah. imposed? Or- yeah, I, I got. I, I want to get that Fox Shot mic, nine millimeter, and the forty-five. Uh, I'm not trying to copy Uncle Jim, but there's they look like fun guns. So yeah. <laughs> their advertisement schemes work because a lot of people's got inter- interest in those. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, I see if I, since I got the range, might as well I'll yeah. try it out, try some some funky stuff. Yeah, um, you can slap a brass catcher on that and let them fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about a thousand rounds in, and uh, I'm all over target. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the funny part. I actually, um, off camera, I shoot more nine millimeter than anything. Um, disgustingly, a lot. I, I shoot about 500, 600 rounds a weekend. Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, a lot of it is um, just being proficient with the CCW. So yeah, the, it, that's why I wanted to start loading nine to get shooting more and i still haven't i i've i've shot more recently than i have in a while but it, it's not uncommon for me to go three months and not shoot my pistol yeah yeah um i in the morning what i do is i go out there i'm actually shooting all day i'll go out there and i put transition targets and i learn to transition fast holster transition you know and then um just work from there because I don't know. My, my uncle was, was really a big uh, IDPA uh, managed mm-hmm. person, and I don't feel like I'm up to that yet. But just to practice alone and the responsibility of, of the CCW, yeah, um, I always have that fear of hitting someone behind. You know? Yeah, um, yeah, you got to have the confidence to use it, or you don't even really need to be carrying it. That's yeah, yeah, and it, th- that's unfortunate. A lot of people don't have that mindset of, uh, well, I got this responsibility. And you think they're going to save the world, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Which I, I just took my refresher course there a couple weekends ago. And, and you know, there was uh, 18 of us in there. And, and you know the crowd, the the complete idiots in the back with the stupid questions. And you're like, and this guy's got a license to carry a gun. I mean, the the, the crazy scenarios they bring up. And uh, it, yeah. it, it ain't good. Yeah. yeah the, I'm going to put an RMR. That's definitely going to save, you know, save lives. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's nuts. It, it's unfortunate to see that because, uh, it, it, like I said, it is a huge responsibility. Um, and I really wish anybody that whoever was in service didn't ever have to experience taking a life. You know, it's uh, it's somebody's child. You know, and um, it's nothing to have uh, you know, put onto your soul. It's pretty tough to have. Yeah, I mean, you you never want to have to use it. I mean, that's saying, and and I'll, I'll share a little story here. When we got into class, I mean, the uh, the instructor is a police chief at the next town over. Uh, I don't remember what he said. He's got twenty twenty three years law enforcement, but uh, he gave a scenario of a guy at a shopping mall, and he walked into a public bathroom, and there was two or three guys kind of huddled around the sink, and uh, this guy went into one of the stalls, and he said there was a couple other people in there and they left and these two guys started approaching the stall and they were standing right in front of the door and he could hear him talking and they was getting ready to kick the door in. And, uh, the guy actually drew his pistol and was waiting for him and someone else walked in the bathroom and, uh, the two guys scattered and he goes, if you don't believe me, that happened to my son and he's sitting right there. Yeah. 
And I mean, that was that was crazy. And he said where it happened, and that is very close to here. I mean, it's less than an hour away. Um, yeah, I and um, <clears throat> I would think that where I'm at is pretty gun friendly. Everybody here pretty much carries, and I don't foresee that ever happening. Um, I still have my CCW for California, so that's where I'm fear of is when I go yeah. down and see family, you know. But, We're um, extremely rural. Everybody's used to them. I mean, we don't have open carry, but I mean, I see people pretty much open carrying here and there. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 I have two theories about that. To me, that's kind of ignorance because that's the first guy that's going to go yeah. out. Um, two, but it, it, it's convenient. If I'm going out to the range, I'll slap yeah. it on. I'm driving there. I'm going. I'm not going to the store. I ain't going to the restaurant. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm talking about folks that are big Second Amendment advocates and supporters, but then they just totally portray us like idiots, you know? Yeah. No. yeah. And I'm not used to that. Indiana has open carry, and I was over there uh, last weekend, or I guess about a week and a half ago. I mean, I was in a Royal King, you know, farm and home store, you know, five or six guys in there open carry, and just it's not uncommon. Yeah. <laughs> I go to Vegas, and you can see it all the time. Um you know, gun shows. And we're just, we're just not used to that. I mean, it's just, we're not used to seeing that. Yeah. My wife, when, um, <laughs> when she, when she moved over here, she, you know, her being raised and born in California, um, that was a whole different, uh, life lifestyle to get used to. She's sitting there at Denny's and you get to see her to keep looking over and just guy <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, Smith the Wesson now. It's a big old dirty hairy gun. <laughs> I looked at him, I gave him a thumbs up. I was like, badass dude. I mean, I mean, yeah. I just dig the gun, you know, but she kept looking at it and looking at Timmy. I told her, just relax. You're safe. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he's first on the list. <laughs> yeah, he's first on the list. I'm going to grab that firearm afterward. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, it's a whole different lifestyle. But I, living here, it's, it's, I feel less stressed and I actually feel safer um, compared to where I was. You know, there's a lot of riffraff and, uh, the, the schools too was another reason why I moved, but yeah, it's um, it's just proven, you know, it, 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 having firearms around and just yeah, you know, I mean, I feel very safe in our community. There's a lot of us licensed carry holders. Um, we have the uh, you know the the no gun sign that's you know forcible by law, and when it first came out, you know, it was like everybody was posting these signs, and then they actually realized that's not a real good idea. And uh, a lot of them come down. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think West Edge Shooter bought another SWFA right now. Yeah, is that what you got? <laughs> he said he jumped out to buy another scope and twenty MOA mount. <laughs> Uncle James, bad, no bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm. I'm Speaking of that, I'm really happy for Uncle Jim, honestly. And I know he's he's kind of a, in a different emotion right now, mad. And, yeah. <laughs> but you know what, man? We love your videos, Uncle Jim. And um, you probably heard all the names, but there's a lot of folks out there that, that contribute to this. And uh, we're just happy to, to see you happy, man. So don't, don't think that you need to repay us back. Hey, man, you're, you're family to us. So we're going to take it. You know, we're going to do what we can to help out. So West Desert Shooter bought a Diamondback Tactical. No way. Went Vortex. Okay. The four to sixteen. Okay, so I seen that scope. There's a the shop here was selling it for like two hundred and twenty bucks. I don't know if it's used, but I almost jumped on it because it was a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to get the six by twenty four though. Yeah. So you know I what? guess that's going on the Grendel. West Desert Shooter. Yeah, I forgot he's got the Grendel. Oh, okay. That's going to be cool to see. I, I, I have yet to see any performance out of a bolt-action Grendel, or, or at least the channels I watch. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think so. Yeah, they've all been gas guns. Yeah, always gas guns, exactly. Yeah, so that, that one guy out of Utah on the uh, long-range shooters, he shot 1,500-yard milk jug with a Grendel, and that's impressive. Yes, I, I just saw that video recently because I'm looking over their challenges, and yeah, that's that's crazy. He was my spotter or whatever, and I mean, he knows his stuff. He is a shooter. Okay. Um, I'm, I definitely got on the emailing list, sent them an email. Hopefully, I can get on their uh, next challenge. Yeah, um, they kind of changed the date on that. It's pushed back a week this year. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to just try. Just yeah. Uh, I'd say as long as you've uh, if you've got, been in contact with them, I'd say you got a pretty good shot because they like for new shooters to show up over you know the same people year after year. So yeah. How was the? I mean, was it intimidating to seeing folks there, or was it pretty good experience? I mean, you kind it, of talk- it was really good. I mean, you know, when you first get there, you don't really know anybody. It seems like, but I mean you have a, a dinner the night before at a, a local restaurant and that's kind of the meet and greet. And we had a, we had two Indiana guys. Uh, I've shared this before. We knew like 50 common people. So, I mean, we had tons to talk about. I mean, we're, we're 20 hours from home and you run into people that know people that, you know, it's just crazy. So, you know, the three of us kind of hit it off. And then where we was staying, there was a uh, two other shooters staying in the rooms next to us. So, you know, when we, we was at the uh, motel or whatever, you know, we was out front talking, you know. So, yeah, everybody got along great. Everybody was more than helpful, sharing guns, showing guns, whatever you needed. Yeah. And uh, they, they, a lot of people talk about how they got their rifle set up and, and just basically how they made it there, right? It's Yeah, pretty much. I mean, a lot of custom rigs, a lot of, I mean – there were several savages. I mean, a lot of them running night four scopes on them, but you know, there was, there was a few rifles, you know, that thousand dollar rifle range. So, I mean, and then there was full on custom. I mean, there was everything. Wow. Yeah. And that's where it kind of intrigues me to see how people got to that and why they bought it, you know, um, just cause you know, I was barely dabbing into this precision game and it, there's just so much to it. Yeah. With the, just, just my little bit of experience is like, I don't think in my lifetime I'm going to know enough to even yeah. make a difference. But I just, I mean, just try to keep it simple. And, uh, and if it works for you, keep going. I mean, that's yeah. all I can say. <laughs> I figured it'd be a good little range trip too. I could visit everybody up there in Utah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think on my Christmas card list, I sent, let me think here. One, two, three, four. I sent about five or six Christmas cards to Utah, so there's a lot of good people over there. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I'll visit them all. And I think if I stop by Uncle James, I might just move in though. So yeah, <laughs> he's got a. Yeah, I'm sure you'll stay there at least a week. <laughs> no, it's just it, man. He looks like a resort, man. Where, where his yeah. house is. So um, definitely, the yeah. Thing, <laughs> the thing time. I missed the most was we was in Utah, and we just didn't have time to see all the sites. I mean, we had like a half a day and and it, there's so much there to see i mean i wish i could have spent a week there yeah it, i definitely gotta check out or stop by and visit full of taco he's got all the crazy guns yeah yeah I mean, just show up to the long range shooters of utah and just tell them hey i'm gonna try all these out yeah i got a 338 <laughs> specter and a <laughs> I'm taking a specter out to 1500 <laughs> subsonic <laughs> That'd be, that'd be pretty funny. Um, yeah, the, most, the most impressive rifle was that it was a 375 snipe tack, which is a variant of the shy tack. Wow. And that rifle was, it was, a, it, I never seen anything like it in my life. The, uh, the concussion off that muzzle break, I swear was picking up that hut. It was the most wildest, the amount of air coming out of that barrel. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I've, I've shot a side tech, a shy tech before. Um, I gave the guy five bucks just to let me shoot a couple yeah. rounds. And yeah, it's an experience, man. It, yeah. it feels like a 50 almost, but it's less recoil. It's kind of yeah. weird. The, the barrel, it was a two inch profile barrel. So it was two inches of meat. Wow. And yeah. uh, the action, the, uh, the walls of the action around the bolt was like a half inch steel. Oh, wow, man. And I think it weighed around 40, 42 pounds. Okay. Um, if I was to step out to the seven millimeter uh, ball game, the cartridge I'm looking at is a seven millimeter STW. Um, it's kind of based off the Weatherby Magnum cartridge. So yeah. it, that's basically, if you're going to go for a string long range, that's the kind of, I think that bullet will perform pretty good. Yeah. And, and it's like I've told people, the six five Creedmoor is not a mile round. It it, no. it will do it, but it, and it, it doesn't do it well, but it will. I mean, you need, you need something yeah. back behind it. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's a well balanced round for reloading. It's it's cost efficient. Yes. You know, you're looking at forty grains of powder compared to seventy grains. You step up to the magnum ranges, you know, and then thirty to thirty five cent bullets. I mean, it's yeah, it's just a it's a really good entry precision cartridge to really do a lot of things. You know, you really have fun with it for an average long range shooter. 
but it was probably probably three years ago was really the first time I'd heard of one. And you know, I I've just started loading two forty three, and I started looking at it and looking at rounds, and I was like, it wouldn't cost any more to load six five. I mean, and and that's what got me into it. And then you know, looking around, I, I really wanted the uh, the Savage Stealth, and then I I was gonna I had a budget. It was gonna be budget build. And then the rest of the money was going to the scope. And then I really wanted that Cytron scope, but I couldn't have both. So then it, I'd seen enough videos on YouTube of that Ruger American. I, I was sold on it. I said, I'll, I'll take that gun out to a mile. <laughs> yeah, I almost, um, you, you put that post on Slack for that uh, Cytron, and I almost jumped on it. Um, after I bought that, that silencer, yeah. so I really, really would have pissed the wife off. But. And I... I would have bought it, but I, I wanted to try an SWFA. I just I just had to try one, and if it wasn't for getting that, I would have got the side drawn. Yeah, it, it, I could say after just getting behind it now, I really like that scope a lot. Uh, the reticle just makes sense for me, um, and, and the, as far as the clarity, it's just in line for what I've been you know what I've been trying out. Some of the lower end vortexes and stuff. It's it's good enough. I can see the target. You know, yeah, that's all I really need. I, the mostly what I really needed was something that tracks good. Yeah, and and my thing was I wanted something with the elevation to shoot that far. And you know the Cytron's got that hundred minutes, and I didn't even know about the SWFA when I bought that first Cytron. I never even heard of them. Of course, you know, yeah. in their advertising, like one ten, and I would have probably considered it if I'd knew, known that at the time. Um, they also have that uh, adjustable. It's a six by twenty four. I think they also have. Or yeah, or it's a uh, four to twenty, I think. Yeah, it, it doesn't have all the adjustment that S three does. It's it's just like seventy five. But I mean, I have it on my two twenty three right now. Okay. Yeah, Wes does a shooter put a great comparison for the yeah. seven millimeter WWM. Yeah, that's yeah. I looked in both of those. It's um. The reason why I leaned it is because I shot it. That's the only reason why. You know, I haven't really shot much other rounds, but it just, it kind of, I don't know. The person that was letting me shoot the rifle, I don't know if he was like a, a gun whisperer, but he told me, if you can nail, it, uh, nail the target right now, it was a 10-inch plate at uh, 1,100 yards, that's where we're at, that been angry. Um, if I, you know, uh, five shots, then this is the rifle for you. Yeah. And that's what I was doing. I got behind his rifle and five shots. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So, but um, yeah, I'm definitely willing to try other cartridges. I, I I look at both cost factors, you know, the reloading, how much powder is going to be behind, go through a pound of powder, 100, 100 rounds, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, or less. And that was one thing, you know, H43 was so available, and then it got where it just dried up and, and around here, and then it's back. I mean, I've had no problem finding it, but yeah, I, I, at one time, actually, the the 140 ELD bullets, I was I was struggling to get those. Yeah, yeah, um, I got two eight pound jugs now. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I need to go get <laughs> like a fire locker. So I'm be on it. <laughs> so uh, I got enough forty three fifty to last me a little bit. Um, with the rate I'm shooting, I'm running out of bullets more than than anything. Yeah. I remember one time, you know, Midway was out, Brownells was out. I'd ordered from every site, and I found some little mom and pop shop that had a website in Florida, you know. And I was like, "Oh, they got them in stock!" <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, that's why I call it the unicorn powder, man, because it was it was rare. You, you talk about forty three fifty. It was a myth over there in California. Mm -hmm. If anybody ever had it, man, they were keeping on to it. But it was two years ago this spring. I actually ran out, and I was in Evansville, and there was some gun shop, and I paid. I believe it was 40 bucks a pound. I picked two pounds up and I just, I mean, I was out, they had it and all oh, I hated paying that much for it, but what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. He had more, but I was like, ah, two will last me for a while. I can surely find some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the 4350 just seems to be one of those powders, like just like Barget just works. You know? Yeah. But um, it's another stick powder. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. All the all the loads I've gotten were all sticks, so I I really want to see what uh, other people are talking about with ball powder. They're just saying yeah. ball powder works better, and I I'm all open. You know, I'm I'm not set in stone with what I do, so um, I just haven't had luck yet, man. <laughs> But it just seems like, you know, the, the 6.5 or the 243 with H4350, it just, it shoots itself. It just, 
it just finds that that sticker target and it hits it. <laughs> Yeah. Just like uh, Thomas is out. Yeah, thanks for joining, brother. Um, he's almost on every single live chat. I always see Thomas. Yeah. Getting... So I appreciate that, brother. Yeah, we've yeah. Run, I've seen up about 40, 42 or three, and we still got 38 on board. So uh, yeah, I think yeah, that's pretty good for uh, kind of throwing this together all at once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, the, the little sporadic live chats, um, I don't know how. Um, was it Chico Wise does it, man? It's it's yeah. just fun, you know. <laughs> so uh, it, it it makes the night go by, especially if you have nothing to do or you're out there. In yeah. The the desert like I am. <laughs> um, yeah, I usually just kind of load when I'm not working like tonight. I just load ammo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not remodeling. Um, measuring grains, uh, apparently, uh, it interrupts the chat quite a bit. Yeah. I'm be remodeling. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John Sullivan says, "Is 4350 good powder for 243? Is an excellent powder for 243." Yes. Yeah. Especially when you're about you know 70, 70, 75 grain bullets and on up. But uh, that series I did on the uh, Sierra Game Changers was with 4350, and it was amazing how well they work together. Yeah. Yeah. With WDS, he says 4350 is awesome. Almost everything. Um, Yes, yeah, but I mean that's what I think. It so far thirty out six. I I bet you three oh eight will work good if I got the proper rifling and the and the rifle likes it. Yeah, forty three. And with your uh, your quick load, you could probably figure up a load using it in about anything. Yeah, and you know I'm probably uh, there's probably a lot of folks here probably frown about it, but I only got one reloading book. Um, though I do have SERPs and cut and pictures of reloading books from others. But over the over the time, I've been kind of you know, leaning on this program. It's been proving itself. It's dead on every single time. I have one book. It's the Hornady book. It has a stack of papers in the back of it. It's got five hundred sticky notes stuck in it, and yeah. uh, I've got I've got sites saved. I've got pages saved, and then yeah. I have my dad's old uh, Lyman book. So I guess I technically have two books, but. I'm gonna say I got a lot of those pamphlets and stuff, and I say those just because it has some of the old stuff you never see before, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I wouldn't recommend it because there's always that what if, you know. But I don't know. I maybe I'm just a risk taker. But you know, <laughs> books, these are the books I got. You know, basic old style. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got several of those Hodgson things that come with like your Lee kit and. Yeah. Um. But like I said, you know, the manufacturers are going to be on the safer side, you know, and I appreciate that. And it's just, you still got to work your load up. But what's cool, I got this old Lyman book from probably, I'm going to guess it's late seventies, early eighties. And on this 460 Weatherby mag, it actually lists the uh, factory duplication load in the, in the thing. So uh, you don't hardly see that anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it says the uh, factory load was IMR 4350, 120 grains, and that's a whole lot, and it run 2583. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, th this this book has uh, a lot of the 220 Swift loads, yeah. 7 millimeter BR Remington, 6 millimeter PPC, yeah. a lot of, uh, let's see, 257 Roberts. Some of the cartridges you really don't see much about, yeah. 25 out of 6, you know. All right, there's a set of swift dies. <laughs> wow, yeah. Um, Dima, my friend Dima Proc, um, the one that does the gas check makers, he's got a 220 swift and he loves that that little bullet, man. I was uh playing, what was I shooting? 50, 55 grain bullets, and I was getting them. I had some loads over 4,000 feet per second. Oh, gosh, it is a screamer of a round. I, I can't imagine what that would do with a bar mint, you know? Yeah. Um, well, that was a fun gun. It was a it was a Winchester. I don't remember the model. Maybe Model seventy or something. But it was a it, you know that twenty six inch heavy barrel. It was it was a bench gun, no doubt about it. But the guy that owns it uses it for uh, prairie dogs and stuff like that. So okay, yeah, yeah. Hybrid one hundred V eighty seven V Max is the match combination three yep. forty three. Yep, he had a lot of good luck with that load. Yeah, Hybrid one hundred V. I heard is a really good powder for two forty three. I have never shot it though. <laughs> I I've only seen it on West as a shooter, and actually seen uh, on um, what was it? There was a website. Um, 
precision shooters world or something like that. I forgot what website it is. It's a forum that I was on for a little bit, and I saw a lot of people talking about that powder. Um, John Sullivan talking about a uh, youth gun. My first 243 was actually a youth model, and I bought it, and I did not know it was a youth gun until I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if I did the right thing. I, I kind of feel like I did. This is my son's youth gun. This is his first rifle. You know, it's kind of um, the, the, the compass. Yeah, I think so, it'll serve him well. He's shown he's shown he's got some uh, talent. So yeah, he, so the first video I shot and he did the factory rounds when I was having him sight in the, the rifle. That five shot group was him. Yeah, all those groups were him. I shot, okay, well, I'll probably embarrass myself. My shot was a three-shot group that was kind of all over the place. The same. <laughs> so he right there already outshot, already outshot me. So I'm like, okay. Um, and then at the 10-inch plate at 250 yards, he held that thing within MOA. Yeah. I'm like, for somebody that doesn't, he's young. He's, he's seven. <laughs> yeah. And he was ringing steel at what, 500 too. So oh, yeah, with this factory ammo. So I, I, that's why I'm, I'm really kind of excited to see once we get a load develop, what he'll do. And I, I just can't wait for that moment where we're doing a little tandem long range. Just what I want to do is basically shoot one, he shoots one and then we'll just go to town with, with steel yeah. and um, just, just videotape that just something for him to remember. And um, yeah, at his age, I mean, being that good, he's he's gonna have some. He's got some talent. He's gonna he's gonna do some things behind the rifle. I got it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's scary. It for me because I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm com I'm competitive, and but <laughs> I, I'm also um I'm I'm very proud. So if, if he could outshoot me, I'm I'm happy. You know, that's yep. all that matters. But that means you did your job. <laughs> did job. Yeah, yeah. Just like I said, but there's always gonna be someone better. You know, but um. Yeah, I let him. I let him uh, do all kinds of things. I let him try shotgun and pistol, and um, he just fell into the bolt action. I mean, that was yeah. just it, you know. So. We never really grew up with the rifles because we, you know, around here was deer hunting with shotguns, and you know, we started with, you know, like my that video, my first guns, a cut off stock twenty gauge that kicked like a mule, and <laughs> we went to the twelve gauge pretty quick. Yeah. Um. One thing that, you know, that, that I always fear was him kind of going like uh, Big Daddy and just killing all the birds and all that, you know, <laughs> the movie Big Daddy. Um, I, I, I kind of show him to have respect for animals. You know, you don't kill yeah. nothing, but you're going to eat it, you know, or you got to protect your family. Yeah. It's not, not fun to take away all wildlife because then that just it ruins the fun for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think we ought to start wrapping it up, maybe. Anybody out there got any questions or anything? Yeah, I wanted to see what folks wanted, you know, what kind of bullets. Because I know a lot of folks got 308, you know, and they yeah. probably got the bullets worked up. But, um, you know, throw in the comment below or, or any of our videos, suggest what you want to see as far as kind of what kind of bullet. Um, and to, to your surprise, you know, sometimes things may work and may work better. Yeah. So, um, in that last video, I, I said if anybody wanted to trade, uh, one guy offered me some 155 grain barns. So I mailed him out. I think I had I, I sent him 30 rounds. I think I sent Curtis 10 today, and that's all my spear bullets. But he's going to send me back some uh, match burners, I think. So oh, wow. I'm looking forward to shooting some of those. Yeah, that, that worked. I think me or, or, or at least, you know, pretty fortunate to be able to shoot quite often and with the weather I got. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's going to turn south for me a little bit here shortly. But last winter, you know, over Christmas break or whatever, it was 30 degrees high. Ground was froze. I was shot every day for about 12 days straight. I, I shot, I believe that week I counted like 1,200 rounds I'd shot that week. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, 260 loads. Um, I'm not sure if Ryan's wondering. I, I don't have a 260, but... I do. I, I am fond of it. I kind of think the 260 could kind of outperform the 65 in certain certain ways. Yeah. But um, I I don't think I'm ever gonna buy one unless I you know I find one for a good deal. Uh, let's see. But um, there's a lot of weird bullets. I mean, we got like the 125 grain uh, V maxes and Z maxes that we could try out. Yeah. So yeah. Varmint load. Yeah. Varmint load exactly. Uh, I got you know, cast lead bullets. I got 
Shoot. The majority of my molds are all 30 cal, so I'm gonna try every mold I got, see what I can do with it. Uh, just to have a good plinking around. Yeah, I kind of, we can go down to you know 110 grains, so I mean get those up to 31, 3200 feet per second. So yeah. Um, for the casters, I am planning on paper patching uh, this this round pretty soon. I elbowed it. Basically, the Coats Brothers firearms bullet. I've been saving it for this rifle, actually, so I could paper patch and try it out. Um, I think I'm, I'll be able to kind of merge long range and casting with that that old type technique. Is Uncle Jim offering to buy us Lapua bullets? Is that what that question mark means? Oh, he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. He wants any Lapua bullets, huh? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, when I buy those those Elko bullets, I'm going to send you a box too. That way, okay. Uh, you can them out. Um, yeah, we'll try both. I'll try Lapua bullets and Elko bullets. I'm all for it. This man, that makes the the three the three away kind of in the three hundred wind mag. Realm, yeah. You know? <laughs> we got three hammers, one for me, one for you, and one for Ocean. I guess. <laughs> there we go. All right, Lapua Lapua bullets. It is Uncle Jim. I'll get some. <laughs> you know, it's kind of wondering. I always wonder because the, the three away is very similar to the six five as far as the cartridge, right? Yes. Um. I almost wonder if it will benefit off with a small rifle prime brass. You know, I, I've yet to see any 308 with a small rifle prime brass. Uh, Starline makes it. Starline does. Yep. Wow. If, okay. If you look up their 308 match brass, it is small rifle primered. It is. Yes. That, I'm going to test that out because. Because they asked me what I wanted. And I, I wanted to stick with the large rifle. That's kind of the proven for me. But yeah, they have it. Okay. I. I might just kind of go off the deep end and try that out just because um, I've been having luck with small rifle prime brass. Um, I tried it with a 30 out six. There's a, there's a, a few brass that I have that I picked up at the range with small rifle prime. I don't know if you ever saw really? it. Uh -uh. Yeah. And those, those actually gave me a, a better velocity and a better group with my rifle before I ruined it. Dusty or, bow hunter wants to know the largest rifle cartridge you have shot. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there it is next to a 223. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. That was like a 22 short next to that thing, man. And if you want to make a 223 disappear, you just go, uh, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, loads of bacon just showed up. Yes, we gave away a truck, and you won, but you had to be present to win, so we'll just keep it. Yep, better luck next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, at least, yeah. I can't believe he, he stopped by. That's cool. Yep. Okay. Let's we'll give see. some people something to watch tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any uh, Lake City brass for 308? There's a suggestion. Um, I do. I have some Lake City brass. Um, it's been chewed up quite a bit. So I think it went through an AR-10. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of Remington brass, a little bit of Hornady, and then 100 rounds of Starline is what I have in 308 brass. Okay. You know, Starline brass seems to be pretty good brass, man, You know, from my experience so far. And it, it just, it, the primer pockets are holding up. Everything is just giving me better groups with Star. I have really never had a loose primer pocket in anything. I, I mean, and I've shot a, I mean, I've shot 6.5 brass. I've wore it out before. Yeah. I, I wore out 30 out 6, but that's because it's 30 out 6. That's the only brass that I've ever seen uh, have worn out primer pockets. Well, I take that back, third or blackout. And that's yeah. just because I went through, I think, 10 reloads. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, man, man, we're still going. Oh, yeah. Um, I do want to try Peterson Brass. That's another company. Yes, that seems to be some top quality stuff. Yeah, I think JRB recommended that. So I wanted to try that out in 6.5. Um, Bold Action yeah. Reloading has been using it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I bought a neck turner, a K&M neck turner. That's on its way. Uh, just to see if that will even help out, you know. Um, I, I kind of want to try to get my run out down to one if I possibly can. I think that's yeah. what's holding me back as a nectarine. 
So we'll see. Yeah, West Desert Shooter just said, you know, the Valkyrie is eating up the primer pockets in one shot. It, it, yeah, a lot of people are saying that, man. It's um, They don't know if the factory just didn't get the right blend or what on the brass. But it's not it's not doing too good right now as far as life, you know, life expectancy on a Valkyrie. Which, That's really probably the big downfall of that cartridge. Yeah, there's a lot of hype on it. I, I'm still, I, you know, I can say that I'm still not 100% sold on it. I, If it comes to the point that where it's a good deal, I'd definitely go for it. Yeah. It always kind of intrigued me the first time I heard about it, you know, it, when they yeah. kind of released it at SHOT Show, and then, you know, it was going to be a, you know, a, a mainstream caliber, and then it just, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You always I, figured, to get a couple of years. I figured there'd be a few bold action offerings on it, but there really never has took off. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give it a couple of years. I think the Valkyrie's going to stick around. It looks like a, a pretty good cartridge just for, you know, just just because you can shoot a 90 grain bullet out of an AR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but you, you got the 22 Grendel, and that's another AR round. That's yeah. Well <clears throat> but. I don't know. There's always something new, new and better. <laughs> That's what keeps us yeah. um, keeps us lining their pockets. <laughs> yeah, folks like, you know, folks like us. I keep getting asked, like, "What's next? What's next?" And I, like, I don't know. I ain't seen it yet. <laughs> and, and the funny part is, when I first started reloading, I got to the mindset of, "I'm just going to reload one or two calibers, and just have a bunch of guns for that, just so I'm proficient at reloading that." I'm up to seven calibers now. Yeah. So it's a uh, yeah. I have seven dies that are mine that I load for, and then there's a couple, at least three, four more that aren't mine that I have here. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, And I was talking, my little reloading bench here, it's two foot by four foot where my press is mounted and everything. And when I put it here, I said, what in the world am I going to do with all this space? I am down to a little two foot by one foot work area now. <laughs> Oh, man. I have a full-size office desk next to this, and it is just about full, too. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I always see everybody with, like, pristine reloading benches, and I try to be that way. But it's like, it just doesn't happen. When you get into the mood, you're like... Yeah. I'm so I mean, I got everything in front of me that I need. I know where it is, and, you know, yeah. it's, I don't put it away. It just stays right there. Yeah. The one thing I do uh, do, do is keep one powder out at a time. Yes. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've done that mistake where you, you empty out your hopper in the wrong canister. My powder measure has H4350 in it, and the can is sitting right beside it, and that is the only can that will be out. Yep, yep, I'm the same way. And then my uh, my progressive press for my 9 millimeter, I have a label on that powder hopper that says HS6 written on it. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's probably a really good idea. Um, I don't know if... if uh, if loads of bacon knows anybody that does magnets, um, definitely make a magnet for the value uh, for the turret presses on the Jim's magnet, and then also label magnets for our uh, powder measures where you could throw it on there and yeah. or you just stick on labels or something. Well, really, like a, a little rubber band or something. You know how they have the like 300 yeah. blackout for the AR mag, just something you could slip over it. Yeah, that's a really good idea. It, it just helps organize things, you know. Um, even even reloading dies, you know, when you stack them up, you can see the, the reloading die a lot better. Any, anything, just label. Make you, were, uh, you were talking about 6.5 and 3.08 being similar. I, I run one or the other through the wrong die the other day. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. I think I took a, I took a 6.5 die and ran it through my 3.08 die. I was like, oh, it, it sized a little hard, and then I pulled it out and seen what I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I did the same thing. I went the other way. I went from a 3.08 to a 6.5. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess you could do that. <laughs> I have made a 6.5 Creedmoor out of a 243. You can do that, but okay. it ain't worth the effort. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it looks like the 308 is the 6.5, pretty much the same cartridge. It's maybe a little bit different. I, I, didn't, I was looking at it earlier. It's I had you know, identical cases. I had the head stamp up on them, just grabbed it. And <laughs> yeah, the, the, the bottom uh, case head is a little bit more... Um, angle on the 6.5 or on the 308 I mean yeah so I don't know but I heard of people making 6.5 brass out of 308 but I don't see the reason for it um, 
Yeah, I, I didn't know Starlight makes small rifle prime brass. Yeah, definitely yeah. jump onto that. But I, I believe it's called the 308 match. Okay. I'll find, you know what? If I buy it right now, um, I'm about to do it right now. Three weight brass. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I bought a marker board wall back and hung up on my wall. And then, you know, I got all the stuff I want to order from Midway on it. And then all the loads I need to load. And it actually kind of keeps me a little more organized. Yeah, um, I did the same thing. I had a little whiteboard. I had a priority list. The suppressor was on the bottom, but somehow it, um, <laughs> it got bumped up. <laughs> it got bumped up. <laughs> so, um, it's funny because actually, yeah, I have it over there. And uh, I think it was a hat chat. Uncle Jim's hat chat. I was looking at it and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's lost tail. <laughs> so, um, I, I, that's the thing. Once I get one, I'm, I'm going to want like a 45 caliber pistol, you know, uh, suppressor afterwards. Yeah, I was kind of, you know, eyeing those, uh, the modular ones that can be converted to pistol or rifle or rimfire or whatever, you know, buy one, it may cost you seven or $800 or more, but kind of a universal one. Yeah. yeah. All right. But that dream is long gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to, I think one day I'm going to have a cool little video where, because there's like a there's like a ravine right behind my house, and that's where the Dan Coyotes, every night you can hear them go by. I mean, sound like hyenas, man. They're just cackling all the way through the ravine. And up on top of the hill right here is, the previous owner made like a little perch spot where they could have like a little sunday you know sit on a bench but it overlooks that old ravine perfect spot so um i already got permission for all my neighbors it's legal for us to hunt coyotes on our property um i do have agriculture i got chickens and all that so that's mm -hmm. what makes it legal you just have to get written permission with anybody in the thousand yard vicinity all your mm -hmm. neighbors to uh, shoot so that's all set in stone they told me, hey, we don't care, you know? Like, yeah, get them. <laughs> they don't care. They, they hate the coyotes, too, because they, I guess the neighbor right behind me had um, five or six cats. Um, and then I asked them what kind of cats they had, and I figured out that they were, they were house cats. That's the reason why. You know? Yeah. See, I've had a couple foxes in our neighborhood. I haven't seen them for a couple weeks or whatever, but they're I'm sure they're in town eating dog food and cat food and everything else, but... Usually yeah. the foxes are kind of mangy looking, but these are some really good, healthy looking foxes. Yeah, yeah. The, over here too, same as the same. The sage bushes we have here are like three feet tall, and these uh, coyotes are about the same size. They're feeding all the jackrabbits out here, and there's, yeah. there's just an abundance of them. Yeah, we got a lot of rabbits here in town too. It seems like I see a lot of rabbits. Yeah, I almost bought that ATN um, scope uh, for that reason too, so you could shoot at nighttime. That it, yeah. it has, it has a, the camera in it, so you could you could Wi-Fi stream it and all that. That's cool. <laughs> it's a cool scope. I mean, it just it had a lot of uh, firmware updates and issues and stuff. So I, you know, it's seven hundred bucks. You know, <laughs> I don't know. We'll Curtis, see. this is not gonna go eight hours. <laughs> no, we're we'll probably gonna end this pretty soon. I gotta get up in five hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All night, Kenny. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, know. I have. I, I basically live off three, four hours of sleep, which is um, not healthy for you, but that's just how I am. Um, yeah, well, you you can probably trust us a little more than Uncle Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's only two of us. <laughs> yeah, and, and all his hat chats and stuff turn into two chats, so he can go even longer. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, man, which Curtis? <laughs> C yeah. Curtis or K Curtis? Yeah, I'm gonna give Curtis some, the not Tin Man, but uh, Cheap and some crap. I've never seen him comment any of my videos. Did you see my little meme I made at Tin Man on Slack? Yes, that was, <laughs> that was funny. Oh my gosh! About yeah, I was drinking soda. And it, that, yeah. <laughs> I uh, loads of bacon liked it or hit the little heart on the live stream, and it popped up, and I clicked it, and I, I'd already seen it, and I was like. I got to do something here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so that, that was on the live chat. I did not know that. His eyes, I mean, they were huge. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. And <laughs> the ATF. Oh, gosh, I kept yeah. laughing every time I glanced at that photo. 
I, I you know what? Let me um let me pull it up. So I know the gym is um he doesn't have uh Yeah, it'll probably be two to three weeks before he sees it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh that was on the water cooler, right? Yes. Oh gosh. All right. Tin man, you're about to get blasted again. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was hilarious! All right, Jim, what we're what we're talking about? <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> that Point was your camera weird. down just a little bit more. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. All right. Yep. Yeah. This is the moment when you realize the ATF has been to your buddy's house. <laughs> 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 oh gosh, <laughs> Tim man, thank you, brother. Thanks for being a good sport, man. That, it's just, that's just funny. <laughs> but he wants that to be the official thumbnail for all Reloader Network chats. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I agree. Oh man. <laughs> well, I think we'll wrap it up with that. I think it's been pretty good chat. Yeah, uh, Josh, thanks for uh, inviting me out here, man. Yeah. It's always always great to, to to talk to folks that have a you know great knowledge with this sport, man, and long range shooting. Um, I'm learning a lot from your channel, brother. To be honest, I'm trying to put out as much as I can. Sometimes the videos work out, and sometimes they don't. So, yeah, yeah, and um, you know, we just have a great community. You know, as those who know um, who are here, who, who have been here, they just know that we don't become friends. We're we're family now. You know, yeah. we've been around for a long time, and um. If you stick around with with this community, you you'll get to see that. You know, so I right. trust you guys more than a lot of people I know personally. <laughs> yeah, that's the funny part, right? It's like we're miles away, you know, and uh, yeah, it, it's cool to, to to get to know each other. And I hope to shake you guys' hands one day and thank you, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope folks uh, kind of join the community, uh, the Reloaders Network, and stick around with us. Um, yeah, check check our videos out and. You know, we just learn together. You know, we're just average people. We're not anybody to prove anything, or we're just doing this for fun. Yeah. I think with that, we'll end it. So, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, still running twenty-seven on here. Uh, Meg wants everyone to know that March eighth is Uncle Jim's new designated birthday, since he can't find out when the real one is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And with well, that, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, Trey was asking me about these T-shirts. I have a little bit left. Um, I did. I did promise some to a few people, so I need to look at the inventory. Uh, it's in my storage. So, um, Trey, hit me up on Slack, uh, and we'll talk about it. Uh, I know loads of bacon is trying to make something for TRN as far as apparel. Yeah, which being able to sell it on the store would be a lot easier now too. So exactly. So with that, we'll end it. Thanks for coming by, everybody, and good night. Good night, folks. Thanks for just joining.